Uh, welcome everyone to uh, Talmo Workshop as we uh, approach the, the, the end of this academic year. I think this is a, a sort of a great opportunity to, to reflect upon uh, uh, some of the practices, some of the ideas that we've, we've all been able to implement over the last year and really learn from, from the practice of, of other colleagues. So again, I think a big uh, thank you to all of the speakers that you will uh, see here today uh, at this, um, this Talmo Workshop. Uh, we've got um, a broad programme, so lots of kind of different sessions, some shorter talks in the form of, of lightning talks, but also some more uh, extended talks where we'll, colleagues will prevent, present some data and, and, and some evidence of the impact of some of the interventions. Uh, so a, quite a, a varied and, and diverse programme, so hopefully something here for, for everyone to kind of look at and maybe take away some ideas. Um, we're going to use sort of two main mechanisms, I, I think, throughout the, the meeting. The chat, um, you know, please do use that to kind of share any ideas or suggestions or information that you've, uh, that you've got to interact with, with other delegates. We will uh, look to kind of sort of publish that and, and make that available as a resource. I think that's a, a really useful resource um, that's very rich in information that, that we often find on the, on the Talmo website. Um, but if you've got questions for the presenters, we will have some blocks of time after uh, talks. So after each kind of uh, longer talk or, or block of two shorter talks, um, please do post them in the Q&A and we'll try and facilitate uh, some of those. Please do tag uh, who you're aiming the question at because our presenters uh, will very, very kindly kind of try and answer some of those if, if we don't cover uh, absolutely everything. So Q&A, things that you want to target at the, the presenters. Um, general comments and suggestions, please do um, pop them into the chat. But as Kevin said, please do note that, that this will be um, recorded and, and made available. Uh, and then finally, just a, a quick plug for the, the Talmo website. Uh, it really is a kind of a growing resource and we get lots of requests now to kind of add information on and case studies and examples. And there really are some sort of lovely uh, materials on there for, for all colleagues to, to take a look at. So if you have Anything that, that you want to share or disseminate or link to, please do get in touch with one of us. If you have ideas for activities and events that might go uh, forward through Talmo, again, you know, please do uh, feel free to, to get in contact uh, with us. Um, but I think without further ado, it's uh, back to the programme and I think over to Kevin. Yes, hello. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's good to see that we've uh, got so many people turning out at uh, what's nearly the end of the year. So, uh, you know, if you want to say hello in the chat, then do, do say hello in the chat and say whether you're finished or not, because um, it would be interesting to find out how close people are to uh, having finished this year, apart from, apart from the resits, of course, that'll probably happen during the summer. Uh, and if you, if you want, you can stick uh, in, in the chat how many times you've been uh, jabbed, if you've got the jab yet, and I've been done twice, so yeah, there we go. Um, but anyway, great to see so many people turning up today and I, uh, I'll, I'll start introducing the, the first batch of speakers. So first up we've got Thomas Wong who has actually given a Talmo talk before uh, but uh, this time he's here to talk about where is the 4x speed button. Thomas. Okay all right so I'll uh, get my screen shared and we can, uh, we can get rolling. Um, okay so Hopefully things are sharing properly. Yes. Okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome, you know, for having me back again. Uh, today I'm joined with by my uh, co-conspirator, uh, Kylian Ong, who is uh, my colleague in Malaysia. So it's uh, late in the evening for him. Uh, <laughs> um, so our little project, this is something we did uh, over the last academic year. And uh, the point of this is that we're, we're kind of both new academics and want to do something that's practical, that... Uh, if you wish, you can take away today and have it implemented by September. Um, and we'll kind of show you what we did and, uh, and hopefully you'll see that, yeah, it can be done. So, uh, so here's the setting. Um, obviously everyone has moved on to online teaching. Uh, at Harriet Watt, uh, we've been given some university level guidance on what that should look like for students. And the two key pieces of information that kind of resonated with us is that there should be an AF focus on asynchronous learning and that content should be delivered in more bite-sized units. So our take home message from that is that we should not just be recording lectures and dumping them online. So we have to do a little bit more, uh, a little bit more than that. 
And the subject that we're talking about is uh, a, linear, a linear algebra subject. Um, over two campuses in Edinburgh and Malaysia, we've got about 350 students. Um, in Edinburgh, it's taken by second year students, both in mathematics and actuarial uh, maths. And in Malaysia, it's taken by first year actuarial math students. So you can see there's a pretty diverse cohort here, pretty large cohort. So we have to kind of be smart about uh, what we do. And in comes Kyle and myself, uh, first time lecturers. This is the first time we're both taking this subject. Um, both Kyle and I are relatively new academics to, uh, to Harriet Watt. So when we were taking on this subject, uh, a key question that we thought was, you know, how can we make this manageable? Um, how do we kind of create a subject you know, within the three months that's fitting, that's still for the students. And obviously as subject leader, my first thought is to kind of just make Kylan do everything, right? Um, but somehow he wasn't quite happy with that. Uh, so we had to move on to plan B. And- Yeah, so, yeah, I talk about our way. So uh, <laughs> they are, yeah, there were two main consideration during our planning stage. Uh, first is we want to make sure that we are realistic. It is important that our approach in the course designs uh, needs to be pragmatic both in terms of time constraints and also the technology involved, right? We ensure that our expectation can be met with little to no additional effort, while compared to the traditional face-to-face -face approach. Uh, second, compared to the usual situation, we feel like uh, we sort of expect students to be insecure and feeling isolated in this mode of learning. We wish to ensure good student learning experience from students from both campuses, by building in engagement bits here and there. Yep, that's, uh, yeah, that's, abs that's absolutely right. Uh, we wanted to make sure that this can be done without kind of you know, uh, spending all our time in the summer doing it. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, presenting a class, um, the kind of the most obvious way we thought was kind of do videos. Um, and you can see videos are a great way to deliver information because they're simple, they're easy to produce, they're easy to edit. Um, it doesn't require a lot of technological kind of expertise to either create or edit or from the student's point of view, it doesn't require a lot of technology to view and engage with those videos. And uh, for a lot of uh, mathematicians, I imagine that's kind of their first uh, approximation to what an online asynchronous lecture would look like is to produce videos. Um, but there are a lot of cons as well. So it's not really an online lecture in the sense that, you know, it's not really a lecture because uh, as everyone knows, videos is a one directional medium. I am just yelling into the void and not knowing what happens. Um, and from the student's point of view, it's very passive. They just sit there and we expect them to absorb the video, which is why, you know, uh, usually what the students do when they engage a new system is to find, well, where is that speed button? How do I make my lecturer talk four times as quickly? or two times as quickly, uh, you know, as, this, as it allows. Um, and in a teaching team, like with Kyle and myself, when there are multiple teaching staff, it often lacks continuity because the, uh, the typical divide is that, all right, Kyle, you do the first half, I'll do the second half of the subject. So there's often a break in between and there's no kind of continuity in, uh, in the flow of the subject. And for me personally, um, it's really dull to record uh, alone. So if I'm recording by myself, I'm just yelling at my screen and, it gets recorded. <laughs> um, so, uh, so an obvious solution to this is to bring in more people, is to kind of spread the suffering around, bring in Kyle in, rope in a student, and just, you know, make it suffer together. Um, and Kyle may have something to say about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to talk about my initial thoughts on uh, Thomas' idea. So when, when he first suggested this in early, late June last year, I was pretty excited with the idea and happy to try it out. I think involving students in course design is always innovative and the results could be very fruitful, but at the same time, as that was really our first collaboration, I was a bit concerned on how things will go, but I guess eventually it was an amazing experience and I believe that's for both of us, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so kind of to kind of convince you that this is something you can do, uh, take away now and kind of have implemented by September. Um, Actually, uh, a year ago, Kylie and I have not met each other. Uh, our first meeting uh, was late June. I think it was like June 20th or something. Um, and then that's when we kind of, uh, I guess that brings on to our next page. Um, that's when we really sat down and we said, okay, how do we design the subject? How many units do we need? How many videos do we need? And uh, that's when we kind of sent out an email to recruit a student volunteer. 
Um, and the way we did that was uh, just to say, hey, uh, I emailed the students in the first year cohort. So students actually moving, about to move into the subject and asked, hey, is there anyone who wants to kind of do this project with us? And then around July and August, that's when we sat down and we did the recordings. Uh, we did it uh, in three or four videos each uh, over two hours. Um, and because of the time difference between Malaysia and uh, Edinburgh, our sweet spot is nine to 11 in the morning, UK time. Um, and then in August, once we have kind of an idea of what the videos are going to do, what they kind of cover, then we kind of build out the rest of the subject using the materials that we had and filling in kind of whatever gaps we needed. Um, so thankfully uh, for us, when I sent out that email at the end of June, we had a volunteer in Emma. Um, so uh, when Emma came on board, uh, we were very excited because um, her, first, her first reaction, her first, uh, her first response to me was that, uh, Tom, uh, I am not a very bright student. Uh, you know, I'm a pretty slow learner. Is that going to be okay? Uh, to which, you know, we respond, yeah, that's great. That is kind of the student that we want, your typical average student. And the reason for that is because we're going to be discussing topics, uh, the three of us. Uh, we're going to talk about the topics. And... Emma, as a student, as your average student, gives us yet another way uh, for students to engage with the content. This three-member dynamic is, I mean, this is not innovative. This is, this is something that happens in podcasts all the time, where an expert, a moderator, and a novice will be discussing a topic. And the mm -hmm. idea here is that it gives the audience a point of entry, regardless of their expertise or understanding of the topic. So students, they may relate to Emma. The really bright students may relate more to Kylan, who is the moderator. And I'll talk a little bit about the roles. Um, so in the in the setup, in the preparation, so me, uh, I will be presenting just like I would with a with a lecture, and uh, and Kylin, he would come in and he him he is an expert in linear algebra. He's he's a teacher, uh, but he's never seen me present linear algebra. So he would act more as a moderator. He would come in with extra explanation, extra clarification, and he would correct my mistakes. And as everyone in the chat will know, um, he's the more grounded one, right? So he, he's the one who kind of has to bring me back in line when I get too sidetracked. Um, yeah, I think basically my presence was to sort of make the sessions to be like less formal or more conversation based. I, I want to add on a bit like, actually we sort of compensate each other in some sense where uh, Thomas will be focused on the bigger picture while I was moderating uh, the details bits in each of the topics. And the fact that we sort of correct each other mistakes, I think this sort of add values by letting students know that uh, we lecturers are not sort of perfect human being and reflecting on us to be someone who are actually approachable. And this is very important aspects in this online learning world, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So what you're seeing now uh, in, in this presentation, kind of how we present. So I would be kind of taking the bulk of the presentation and Kylie would be jumping in with his inside, his uh, interpretations as well. We actually asked Emma to, to see if she wanted to come in on this call with us, uh, but she very smartly said no, she wanted a proper summer break. So, you know, you can't fault her for that. Um, but, uh, but so Emma, in her role, uh, we encourage her to ask questions, but we're also very careful. We, uh, the reason why we had three of us was to ensure that Emma never felt alone. Uh, as a student going through this subject. So if you look at the timeline, uh, she is effectively going through this subject at four times the speed at, as what a normal student would without the scaffolding, without all the supporting material. So she is an absolute champ for going through it. And with Kylin in the mix, uh, Kylin is kind of more always on her side. So um, she was kind of comfortable asking questions and seeking clarification. And so that's kind of a, that's kind of the role of Kylin as well to moderate, to kind of be on the side of Emma. So she never uh, felt isolated. Uh, a big applause to Emma. I think she did really great. And she is basically representing the whole cohort from both campuses to ask questions in the recording. Yeah, so uh, I saw, I'm seeing a question in chat now. So uh, Emma is actually going through this, was about to go through the subject. So she was moving in from uh, year one into year two. So she would be a student going through a subject. So she would have to listen to her own recordings. Um, so she's not done this subject before. This will be her first time. Um, so in terms of technology, uh, we went with, uh, you know, Teams meeting because Harry Watt uses Teams. So we did start a Teams meeting, screen shared. I use OneNote to kind of write down all my notes. And the idea here is that uh, the notes we made available through OneNote to the students. So as they're going through the video, they can actually see all the notes in front of them. If they want to annotate, uh, they can. Later on, if they want to review, they don't have to look at the video. They just go straight to the OneNote and see a copy of the notes. 
Um, this was a deliberate choice. Uh, we went with a low tech option, uh, one take, we didn't post-processing, no cutting, no editing. It was just a one take. So uh, our mistakes, our goof ups, our jokes are uh, all recorded. So uh, the idea is to give it kind of a more authentic feel uh, just like they would uh, in the lecture. Um, so after we've kind of created most of the videos, uh, we had to put everything together. Um, and so what we did on Blackboard was to kind of, for each unit, uh, we created kind of one of these pages where um, there would be a quick blurb on this is what you're expected to learn or what we're covering, some learning objectives, you know, to master the topic you have, you should be able to do kind of A, B, and C, and then the video. So the video is the student's first engagement with the topic. That's, they look at the video um, and, uh, and kind of get a feel for what the topic is about, some simple examples, some motivation. The key here is to make the, con uh, the course notes make sense. Because as students, um, sometimes uh, when you look at the, the uh, lecture notes, it really doesn't really make sense. You really need an expert to give you the big picture. And that's the, uh, that's the role of the video. And then at the end, there's some tutorial exercises for them to try. Um, I'm gonna see another question uh, in the, uh, here in the chat. Um, yes, uh, at every point we, we told Amber that this is voluntary um, and that you know, she could you know, withdraw you know, if she wanted to at any point. Um, so uh, there is this back and forth, there is this communication. We always checked in with Emma to make sure that she was okay. If she had any questions um, or if she had any suggestions uh, to let us know and that we would kind of incorporate those as well. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of how the unit came together. And uh, like I said, no, um, as the leader, I can kind of do all the easy bits, and now I can uh, just uh, ask Kylin to do all the hard bits. Now that we've done all this, what have we learned? So, uh, Kylin, would you like to take over? <laughs> yeah, I mean the remaining two slides. Uh, <laughs> so, from the core theme point of view, I think uh, one of the highlight of our practices is the results of a uh, dynamic team compositions. So, obviously, the video which involves students is served as a starting point of our course team development as that was really our first time work together. The connection we made during the recording sessions helped us to work closely on the subsequent development on the subject. For instance, facilitating the discussion board. In particular, there were a few successes in our discussion board. Apart from the fantastic participation rate, one of them is we are very glad to see students from both campuses, Edinburgh and Malaysia, providing peer support to each other like for example, they help each other answering their queries. And this sort of creates a community of practices amongst our students. We also involve teaching assistants in helping out our marking by using an assessment tool called Gradescope, which is very user-friendly in terms of vertical marking, which is important when uh, the cohort in include uh, two campuses or above. This ensures consistencies uh, in terms of marking across both campuses. In terms of the live sessions, we are using the same team page for conducting our live sessions in different time zones. What we did is uh, we complement the content of each other's sessions. And this is to cover, increase the coverage as we could refer them to each other recordings when appropriate. Results in a more effective and diverse way of delivery content. Uh, next transition. Yep. So I want to highlight about uh, Emma as a student champion. I feel like one of the strengths that we have in face-to-face -face sessions is that we can observe the class dynamic and environment from time to time to know whether students demonstrating understanding on the topic or not. So this is clearly a disadvantage in pre-record knowledge transfer videos. And one benefit of having Emma involved in the recording session is to a certain extent address this issue so Emma, as a student champion, she acts as a pace setter from the design perspective. She slowed down the pace of content delivery, discussion, and also seek for more clarification whenever she feel like uh, things could be further elaborate or explained. Uh, besides, having Emma constantly provide feedback to us during the recording period is pretty helpful. It helps us to identify potential issue. For example, the pacing of the course, uh, the weightage of material involved, and also like the length of recordings, right? So uh, the final slide. A few survey has been circulated in last academic year and the feedback on the course team are overwhelmingly positive. 
more than 75 responses from both campuses mentioned explicitly that they found the video to be engaging and useful. I just raised out a few summary points of the responses. So students resonate with Emma questions and feel like it is very really helpful to have her asking questions in the recording. They agree that the interaction in the videos were able to imitate the learning environment of an actual classroom. This sort of makes students to feel less isolated when studying alone at their respective location. Lastly, the student mentioned that overall, there is a high level of engagement throughout their learning journey in our course. And this is indeed a positive result extended from the connection we established in the collaborative video. Yep. So yeah. So uh, I think I think this is a good point to end. Is that uh, the the results were very positive, and the students really appreciate that Emma was asking the questions that they wanted to ask uh, when they look at the video. So I think that was kind of the key takeaway. Is that with Emma, uh, it wasn't that much more work, but the results were just amplified and made it infinitely better. So um, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll wrap it up here. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I see some questions in the chat, so I'll get to those, uh, you know, during the next chat, uh, talk, I guess. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much for that. Yes, let's uh, do a, a round of applause there. Um, yes, sorry, I, I hadn't realized Kylin was there as well. So that's, that's, that's a bit of a surprise. Thank you very much for coming along, Kylin. <laughs> yeah, it is like 8 p.m. now, but yeah, I'm <laughs> glad to be here. It's great, it's fantastic. I, I, I didn't know you were going to be here. Um, well, we do have about a, a minute or two for, for any quick questions, but um, there, was, there was a question in, in the chat, and uh, if people could put questions into the Q&A, there's a little um bubble thing for put in there so we can keep track of them and um be able to to uh, deal with them because if they go in the chat then they can be missed but somebody did ask a question about accessibility maybe i could quickly um, ask yes that. so because we did our because we did our recordings in teams uh teams has a uh, auto captioning uh ability so then if needed we could go back in and just kind of make the small tweaks um that needed that was kind of not captioned correctly uh, as we needed to so we did not have to generate everything from scratch thankfully um i guess the other question that might be of interest is how we recruited emma um so if you want to recruit a student what we did was uh i got a mailing list of all the students uh from and who's in first year about to enter second year so students who's about to enter linear algebra and then i just emailed that mailing list and say, uh, we have this project, this is what we wanted to do. Um, if you are interested, uh, you know, message me back and I can, and we can have a chat and I can tell you more about the details of what we wanted to do. Um, and again, we were just continuously talking to Emma, keeping the communications open about how she was feeling and, uh, and kind of uh, whether she had any suggestions on how we can make things better, so. Okay, great. So um, yeah, maybe we should move along. So thank you very much. Uh, for that, um, I, I do notice in somebody does have their hand up. I did send them a uh, a little message there. I don't know um, uh, if you do have questions to us as organisers, then you can send it via the um, you can identify us hopefully using the chat. Just send it to us rather than sending it to everyone. Um, so you could do that. Um, questions to the panelists, of course, should go through the Q and A as I've said. So now we we, we move on to to the uh, to the next talk um so the next talk is called pal in a pandemic and we, we've got we've got four speakers for this so I, or rather four four names here and I, i'm worried that there's there's three people waiting in the wings i'm not expecting but uh, shall i just introduce jessica because i can see jessica hargreaves is 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 ready to go so um uh, jessica please take it away yeah, there's there's four of us that have contributed, but one of us couldn't make it today. So one of us is going to be both people. So you'll see when it comes up. Okay. Hopefully I've shared my screen. Can we see that? Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Um, Pal in a pandemic. Uh, we hope that's a phrase that we aren't going to hear again. Um, my name is Sue Russell and I'm from the University of York and I work with uh, Jessica Hargreaves in maths. Um, during the presentation, we're going to give an overview and evaluation of PAL in Sheffield Hallam University and also the University of York. Um, we'll share our takeaways, so the things that we would keep from PAL in the pandemic. So peer assisted learning in the UK is best based on SciPass, which is quite a mouthful. So supplemental instruction, peer assisted study sessions 
and it was developed in the 1970s as a, a collaborative learning model. Um, and studies show that PAL schemes can increase student involvement in their own learning, provide a community, departmental community, and improve attainment. And typically it's run in a, uh, a difficult module. Um, PAL leaders uh, volunteer for the roles um, and they're higher year students who facilitate sessions for lower year students in, like I say, a typically a difficult module. And so the sessions are very much designed by students for students. And they're not just for um, students that are struggling, but they're for all students. And, and if you get a wider range of students on the sessions, the better it is. Um, and for the three schemes, they were online in 2020, 2021, and um, optional timetabled sessions. Um, so in terms of training, uh, for across the PAL schemes in the university, they uh, do a, a SIPAS equivalent training, which uh, talks about the structure of a session, uh, types of questions that they might ask the students on uh, the PAL sessions, and then any explore, exploration of scenarios. So what happens if the PAL leaders don't know the answer to a particular question, what happens if there's a student that is taking over the session or any other challenging group dynamics? And then we also did a subject specific. Um, so in this case, for maths and statistics, I gave them some uh, online training based on um, different things like Zoom and breakout rooms and online tools, uh, which we'll talk about uh, in the three case studies. Thanks, Sue. Um, OK, so I'm just going to give an overview of the three different case studies uh, before we go into a bit more detail on each. Um, so PAL at Sheffield Hallam started in 2008-09. Um, um, it was introduced to help with the transition into university um, and basically build relationships or help cement relationships in the first year. Um, it's students from later years uh, that support groups of first years to undertake a project. Um, it is assessed, but it's not attached to a particular module. In 2019-20, um, I tried to replicate this a bit uh, with the first year probability and stats module that I run, which students quite often struggle with. Um, so we introduced it initially um, as more like a drop-in, so similar to stat support, really. Um, so students first years could drop in and speak to um, one of the second year tutors that was helping out. Now, for both of these, uh, when we went online, we used um, Zoom this year, but there were some issues that meant one of us had to be there. So normally Claire and myself would not be present at these sessions, uh, but we had to kind of be there as more of a staff receptionist, which I'll talk about um, in a bit more detail just now, in a minute. Um, then moving on to Jess's uh, case study that she will talk about. So Jess and Sue developed a brand new one this year. Um, so they were it was developed for specifically for remote um, le online learning. Sorry, I'm tripping over my words. <laughs> uh, it was developed specifically for remote delivery. Um, and that is similar to mine. It's again linked to the first year probability and stats module, but it's much more structured. So the more of the traditional PAL um, running. So the original, this is the Sheffield Hallam PAL groups face to face. So as it should be. Um, now, Claire does a really good job of um, doing the training that Sue's already discussed with the PAL leaders at the beginning. Um, she does incorporate the techniques and tools into the training workshop that they are suggested to use um, when they actually do the PAL sessions. Um, they also get a bit of extra support from PAL supervisors, so traditionally third year students um, who offer additional support. So this year, uh, the changes, the main changes, as I said, that one, Claire had to be present as a kind of receptionist in the Zoom room, because when you walk into a normal room, you just go over to the table. In a Zoom room, there might be no one there. It's a bit off-putting. So initially, both of us would have to act as a kind of receptionist putting them into rooms. Um, what Claire did say, though, is that she quite enjoyed the fact she was interacting more with the leaders um, and getting a lot more feedback. And then that's, that, that's something she'd like to kind of keep going. Uh, I'm just going to talk briefly as well about some of the techniques or tools that um, Claire used um, 
to replicate. So she tried to basically replicate everything, all the techniques that she used um, face to face online um, of what worked. Sorry, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for Jessica to move the um, thing. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, so traditionally the uh, Mat Arcade, uh, which has board games, uh, but she had electronic games. There were virtual whiteboards, for example, replacing others. Um, and the one I want to discuss most um, is the use of Google Docs. And this is because it's something that will probably take forward. Um, I've used it as well in my teaching and I think it's very useful. So it's, it's enabling students to get started with discussion. So you give them a Google Doc to fill in, each group has a different space. Um, it does allow the lecturer to see what each group is doing without interrupting, and it gives a permanent record. So this is definitely one of the things that we'll probably keep um, going forward. Uh, so evaluation, we did attempt to collect quantitative data for both this one and the stats one, not very successfully, <laughs> uh, with very few students responding, but we did, Sue was kind enough to do some interviews with some of our supervisors, so the comments that you'll see on the, the slides, the evaluation slides, um, are generally from um, the PAL supervisors. So one of the major uh, benefits this year was that this year students really, really struggled to make friends. Uh, and talk to each other. And I think the PAL, uh, followed by the peer support and STAT, um, really enabled them to sort of bond a bit more and be able to talk to uh, higher year students. So this is a definite plus this year. Um, but obviously it's a lot harder to uh, deliver online. Easier to attend, you just sort of turn up, um, but more difficult because you've got to try and think of new ways of doing things that you wouldn't have to normally. Um, and it took more time, so it takes more time than normal. Um, so for this particular PAL scheme, um, it will revert totally to being in person, but some of the elements will be kept, for example, things like Google Docs or more interaction between staff and PAL leaders. So I'm not going to talk too long about mine because I, I didn't make too many adaptions, to be honest, and it's very similar to Claire's. Uh, but essentially it was introduced because students are struggling with stats understanding. They also have to do programming in SAS and they have to do reporting. Um, so the, the uh, PAL support tutors any, um, help them with all of those aspects, uh, similar to stat support. Last year it wasn't very popular, not many people turned up. So this year we focused it more on the work-based group projects so similar to the original PAL and uh, that has increased in attendance. Uh, we also extended it to second years because they had a lot of disruption to their learning last year and they weren't really they couldn't support themselves uh, so the same tutors as the previous year carried on with me um, so i did get six whole people filling in a, um, a survey uh, and five of those six said the peer support improved their confidence understanding of stats and made them more comfortable asking for help and in the general end of module feedback um, one student um, gave this comment that the module they felt it was the model that was most supported. Okay, finally, some evaluations. So these are comments from uh, one of my tutors um, who did both. Um, so what he says is very similar to what I found in Start Support. So it is good for the fact that you can just turn up or you don't have to physically go anywhere. So it's time, uh, that saves time. But there were often issues with technology, particularly if you're trying to deal with different computing packages, et cetera, screen sharing, and that holds it up. It does take a lot more time. Um, but one of the benefits was that it did give students a regular place to meet. Um, so by regular space, I mean that they normally in working in groups, they'd have to find a physical space. Um, and then one of the benefits here was that they could come to a certain room from wherever they were, and it gave them that space, which is something I'll probably try and keep. Um, attendance was better. Um, next year, I was gonna do online drop-in because it's more convenient, but I'm gonna have to evaluate it early on to see whether um, it's actually worth keeping it totally online. Hey, Jess. So case study three was at the University of York and like case study two, it was embedded in the probability and statistics module. But unlike the other two, as we've said earlier, this one came into being during the pandemic. So it's only ever been delivered online. 
So when we say embedded within a module, the idea is this is advertised to students as saying your provision for this module is you've got lectures, you've got seminars, and you've also got PAL sessions for this module. And we explain it to the students as saying this is like a seminar, but run by students for students. And we thought of it this year as a place where the students could ask questions about the module and university life in general and prepare for the following seminar that would be with a member of staff. So on a week to week basis, we had a PAL debrief session. This was with the PAL leaders, the module lead, which is myself and uh, Sue from the central PAL team. And at that session, we would reflect on the previous session and then work together to plan the next session. So this collaborative approach very much of the students as partners model. The actual sessions themselves were split into three parts. And the idea is I very much thought of this in the same way I'd approach a seminar. So you have something prepared. So you can see point three there is some activity that you've prepared. But I would always um, in my teaching make sure that there's an opportunity for the students to ask any questions they have so that you are uh, adapting it to what the students needs are so in a similar manner but run by students so the first things we had was a drop-in which the PAL leaders labeled as ask us anything I think they meant anything so it was about the module any other module university life in general I've no idea what um what was asked there because what happens in PAL stays in PAL uh, but I know that a lot of the students found that really useful the next thing we did was legal hints. So this was tips for the piece of work that they had to hand in that week, uh, approved by the lecturer. Of course, most of the things they were asking in the drop-in was about the assessed piece of work. Um, however, by making it very clear that it's part of the session, the idea was that it would advertise that to the first year students so they would see a benefit of attending that they might get some inside information on an assessment. And we all know when things are linked to assessment, numbers tend to increase. The final part would be the main piece of the session, which would be an interactive pre-planned activity. And with PAL sessions especially, the idea is that it's interactive, it's collaborative. So because we were designing these sessions online, we used all the tools that I'm sure you're familiar with and I think lots of people are going to talk about today. In terms of evaluating the scheme, the overwhelming feeling was that it was a success. The key principles of PAL, as we've already said, is about this building a community and to build that community, taking part in collaborative, active learning. So everybody felt that delivering PAL was particularly challenging this year in the circumstances that we find ourselves in, but particularly necessary this year in the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And everybody involved felt that they'd benefited from it in some way, especially lots of comments about building community and meeting people like Ellen's already mentioned. So we're in a bit of a strange position at the moment because it's a bit like we were last year when you're thinking, OK, I've got to do something in a different way to how I did it before. But we've sort of got the option. Do we totally change it and do it a completely different way or do we stick with what we've got? At the moment, we think a bit similar to Ellen, we're going to retain that three part structure that we discussed, but we will transition those sessions to being in person when we're allowed. Because, like we said, the key aspects of PAL, the building the community, the interactivity, everybody felt, or the majority felt, that worked better face to face. However, those first two things, the drop in and the getting the hints for the coursework, do work well in an online setting it's not that difficult to transition those things they do retain the sort of essential features of that kind of um session so we'll also hold a weekly pal drop-in slash q a session for the reasons that as you can see there them say it's making it easier for themselves and for the pal leaders to attend that um and also you can ask things anonymously or so that at least anonymous to your other students and a lot of students saying that they really appreciated that aspect too and finally, I think we all kind of learn about technology enhanced learning and think about using it, but this experience has really brought home the value of that for this way of communicating anonymously within a session. So moving forward in our in-person sessions, we'll embed that sort of technology that we've experienced because staff and students this year have been exposed to things they wouldn't have normally been exposed to. So hopefully that will land a little bit easier next year. 
So to bring everything together, what have we learned from all of these uh, case studies? Well, I think the general sense is that the key principles of developing a community and uh, having interactive activities generally preferred in person, but it's not all bad. There are benefits to online provision, such as flexibility, being able to be anonymous if you want to. And so therefore it makes those things in a way more inclusive. So interestingly, for the two PAL schemes that are embedded in a module that do have this reason of wanting a drop in kind of Q&A session, they will continue to learn at, to keep that provision. And in fact, I think I might do a similar thing in my modules as well. I might have an online drop in kind of session to ask questions. And then finally, as we've seen, the experience of using online tools has in some ways made us think, oh, this is an equivalent thing to what we'd have done in person, but we like how it works uh, online better, like the Google Doc example from Ellen earlier. Or like we've said, it's really been a refresher of how useful these technology enhanced learning techniques can be. And thank you for listening. Please do, I think we've got a few minutes if you want to ask us any questions. Indeed, thank you very much. It's a quick round of applause. Um, there are ways, I believe, of giving some reactions. I can't remember where they are on this. It's a, di it's a different, way, different, <laughs> different way of doing it. Um, so, do we have any any more questions? I know we've got we've got one at, uh, at Jessica. It says, "How many students were there per session?" Uh, this is <laughs> Ellen alluded to this a little bit. So, it tended to be. In a typical session, we tended to get 10 to 20 and there's 200 students enrolled on the module for mine anyway, but that's fairly typical. As far as I can tell, PAL sort of uptake numbers. However, in the final week, we, we organized a palathon where we had a monster session where they revised the whole module and that really made a thing about saying this is they're going to give you their inside tips on taking exams and of course they were online exams this year so tips about online exams as well. And that was phenomenally attended. I think we got something like 50 students to that. So yeah, there are our attendance numbers. I think it's, I mean, you talked about attendance numbers, Ellen, didn't you, a little bit? Uh, yeah, I mean, for Claire's pal, it's kind of compulsory. <laughs> uh, so they, so the attendance is gonna be better there, but not perfect. Uh, for mine, yeah, we had very few people in the first year. This year we did have more, but like I said, it was tied more to, they work on work-based learning projects. Um, which they get more support with anyway, um, and they were being helped directly with that. So I think that increased attendance to 50% uh, of students at some points. I think more than 50% of students at some points came, uh, but also because it was this, I, I build it as like, this is a place you can work together <laughs> mm. and get support if you need it, as opposed to having to ask questions. Mm. I think there's always with these power schemes, uh, there's always a range of students and I find there's certain students who just want to hear from the lecturer and so you're never going to get those people going to it but um, yeah this year I think it, even even those students really would have benefited of course from coming along and building some communities but yeah I think that's why the numbers tend to be not 100% because it's not quite for everybody but very useful to those that do require that kind of um, interactions. Yeah, in the, indeed, the um, the numbers are never one hundred percent. Not in anything, is it? <laughs> yeah. And I get percent of our lectures. Yeah. <laughs> lectures and things. Okay, well, uh, great. Thanks so much. If if anybody's got any more questions, can they uh, stick stick them in the chat and uh, make sure you you target them with the right uh, right person so we know who they're for. So thank you very much, uh, Jessica, Sue, and Ellen. And uh, Claire Cornock was uh, was somewhere um, <laughs> in spirit. So yes, thank you very much. And uh, now we'd like to move on to a couple of short, shorter talks. So what we'll do is we'll have the, the two short talks and then we'll have questions, but feel free to drop questions into the Q&A at, at any point. Uh, and any comments you have that you want to make, you can put them in the chat, of course, as, as I've said. So uh, first up, um, We've got Mark McDonald from Lancaster University. He's already sharing his slide. As you can see, it's how I've decided to partially flip my lectures. Okay, sure. take it away, right. Mark. Thanks a lot. Um, so I'm sure most of you have are familiar with the idea of flipping, but just to make sure, uh, this is where the video content, uh, there's some videos that are produced as the main lecture content and they are to be watched by students prior to the live sessions. And then during live sessions, um, 
students engage in other exercises and activities. So I think the, I've heard of this idea, it's been around for many years. I think one of the desires is that students think lectures are boring, um, audience participation is fun, but the problem is that lectures feel like there's this tension between doing fun things and getting through the content. And so this is a way of putting the content um, online to free up time in lectures. Okay, so uh, the literature is generally fairly positive on the outcomes, uh, sort of uh, attainment outcomes and sort of module marks and things like that. Uh, but the, the resource cost is high. Okay, and so creating the initial videos is time consuming and it means that it's a bit more cumbersome to make changes if you want to make changes to a module because you have these existing uh, videos that you need to change. So it's better, but it costs more. So is it worth the cost is the question. So this year is a change came, right? There is, uh, we had a pandemic and Lancaster's approach to this. Uh, so most lectures were delivered as pre-recorded videos. Um, that was a university decision. And so they're sort of short at most 15 minute videos pretty much. So here's a screenshot of one of mine. I used Panopto where you get uh, you know, a little shot of my face. There's my cat showed up in this video. There's uh, some, I used OneNote, but there's a, a range of different uh, techniques to produce these videos, uh, but we did it. And we also had live online sessions. So the live online ones where you could cover other content, students can ask questions. And I think the key lesson that we intend to carry forward from that dual delivery is uh, that we shouldn't repeat content. So students didn't like it when we repeated like the same examples and things in both the live and the recorded. And it also is just not, not a good use of their time. Okay. So here's some data. So it's always good to have a slide with some data on it. Uh, I, I've just last week finished marking the exams for this uh, module that I teach is a large second year module of 230 odd students. Uh, and here's their module marks are on the vertical access and the minutes viewed is on the horizontal axis. Um, no real relationship, right? So there's a blue line on the left there is, uh, indicates the total length of time uh, of minutes that I gave them to watch. And there's a satisfying cluster right around that line suggesting most students basically just watched each video once and that was it. So Panopto actually really helpfully uh, records all of the information and lets you download a massive spreadsheet with like all of the video views, how long they took to watch it. So if a student watches a full video, it, even if it, they watched it at twice the speed or even if they pause it, it would just give you the length of that video and record that as a minute. So this represents, you know, it, it doesn't count the, the pauses and stuff. So you don't really know what do, they're doing during the video. And clearly some of the students are absorbing material and, and some are not. Um, so there you go. I mean, I think that the takeaway for me with this data, and I think the literature is similarly kind of um, hard to draw conclusions from this metric. It, it's that you can't really tell what students are doing. Are, are they being an effective uh, independent learner? You can't really tell by, by these sorts of metrics. So, and if I were a student, I probably wouldn't bother with the videos either because the notes are enough. Right, so my plan um, going forward, is to keep the videos. So I think uh, one thing I do know from the videos uh, this year is that they worked really well. Uh, the student satisfaction was as high as that of, I've ever had in a module. So they really liked the way it went and I'd like to capture some of them. So um, I'm gonna reuse the same videos and change my lecture, uh, the activity to be more act, like uh, student exercises and group activities. Not 100%, so this is what I mean by partially flipped. So it'll still be me giving some examples, uh, discussing say assessments, that's something I did that worked really well I think this year, sort of giving examples of student work on the screen and saying, hey, here's what somebody did, it's really great. And talking about the importance of assessments and stuff like that. Um, that worked well, but sort of unloading the main lecture content into the videos. So that's my plan. And then I sort of put at the bottom there a review, a lit, uh, systematic review of the research literature and mathematics uh, education about uh, videos and stuff. That's really interesting read. And the, one of the reasons why I put it there is one of their, uh, they uh, make recommendations about improving the usefulness of lectures. And that's essentially more interactive activities and consider flipping so that the video content is uh, expected to be viewed prior to the live sessions. 
Okay, so the final comment I want to make is that I am, so I've been talking about my personal plans. I'm also the director of teaching in the department in Lancaster. And so I'm responsible for leading and coordinating changes uh, across the, our programs. And our plans for next year are coming more into focus. And I don't mind telling you that about a third of our lectures are planning on basically doing this. So flipping, using the videos from, from this year as part of their teaching for next year. And uh, I mean, Lancaster as a whole is uh, being maybe a bit more ambitious than some universities. I've put a picture of the one of our the lecture theater I hope to be in. We're planning for no social distancing at the moment. So, well, we'll see <laughs> when the term starts, whether that's wise or not, but that's the plan. So summary is uh, we've already done the heavy lifting of uh, creating the videos, which is the hard part of, of flipping. And many of us are gonna try to use that next year, even when we return to in person. So that is um, all I want to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. That was a uh, very interesting. It's uh, uh, it, it's an interesting question to, to find out how many places are going to try and reuse their videos. Because I mean, everybody feels as though well, they've they've kind of sunk a lot of effort into them. Yeah. Yeah, as I say, it's about a third. I think most lecturers are just they want to get back to normal. They want to get back to normal lectures. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're doing a couple of uh, short, short talks here. So we'll have uh, questions afterwards. Um, so um, next up, we've got Peter Rowlett and maybe Alex Corner. Is, is Alex going to be with us today? I, haven't, I haven't, didn't see him in the... Uh... So Alex should be here, um, okay. but I'm going to speak. We thought, we thought in a sort of six minute thing, we wouldn't have time to faff about. Indeed. Okay, so I'll just do. Uh, Alex might watch the chat. It's very hard to do both at once, right? <laughs> yeah. So I'll, I'll do a proper introduction just just for the sake of the YouTube video. So anyway, next up, uh, teaching and assessing unseen problem solving when exams are taken online at home. Peter Rowlett and Alex Corner. So Peter, would you like to start, please? Thank you. Hi. Right. So uh, yes, we we have a module. Uh, we're going to talk about the assessment for that module. Um, I'm going to speak. Alex uh, Corner wrote this talk with me. He's in the in the room, and he might answer things in the chat if you ask them. Um, so we have a module called Game Theory and Recreational Mathematics. Uh, we've run this three times since um, 1819. Uh, taught by me and Alex with David O'Sullivan and Katie Stackles at various times. Um, I think David might also be here, so he might pop up in the chat as well. Um, this is not a module designed to speci uh, teach a specific mathematical topic. What we're doing is using recreational mathematics, i.e. puzzles and games and whatnot, um, as a way of engaging students and the learning outcomes are around communication and problem solving. Um, with the precise topics we chose, uh, a little bit arbitrarily, are uh, uh, combinatorial game theory, graph theory, combinatorics, and a bit of sort of algorithm and computation stuff. These are all topics that lend themselves quite well to, to puzzle-based questions or to the analysis of gameplay. Um, this is a short talk, so I'm going to talk more about the assessment and what happened under COVID. Uh, we wrote this paper about um, the development of the module, so about sort of what is recreational mathematics and what can it do for undergraduate teaching, the development of the module and so on. Um, so please have a look at that if you like. Um, the assessment traditionally, um, you know, the first year we ran it, uh, we have a first assignment, which is an essay, and they, they choose whether, uh, whether to write on a historical topic or an educational topic or, or um, a sort of puzzle exposition thing. There is a second assignment, which is mathematical problems, more focused around algorithms, um, kind of the sort of thing you'd want to give them in a coursework and not in an exam because it's a little bit more time consuming or, or what have you. Um, and then an exam. Now we don't put an exam on a module lightly. Um, we think about whether that's the right method. Uh, here we thought it was the right method. So what we've done is uh, we, did a, we did a section A for 40% of the marks, which were questions using the taught techniques um, from, from sections of the module. And then we had a section B on unseen problem solving. And I, I quite like saying we only have the section A basically because we lost our nerve and didn't dare do the whole thing on unseen problem solving, it's that sort of thing. Um, the unseen problem solving, we give them four puzzles 
the likes of which they hopefully haven't seen before. And it comes with this um, disclaimer at the top, which is full marks for a correct solution that is very clearly communicated. And then for an incorrect or partially correct solution, marks will be awarded for clear evidence of applying a systematic problem solving approach. And we teach a sort of polyer inspired uh, heuristic. Here's an example of an exam, example of an exam question. Um, so on this board, the king, uh, the, knight, the king moves in the usual way for a king, up, down, or diagonally. Um, and the question is, only proceeding, um, if you like, uh, how many ways are there for the king to move from bottom left to top right on this board? So that's, that's the sort of thing we have as a question. Um, now, the marking for this, uh, we mark if it's correct, we, mark, we give high marks for answers that are very well explained, that show some evidence of the problem solving process, especially things like if you've got a solution, you know, how do you know that solution was correct? How do you know that solution was complete? Could you sort of reflect back on the process that's got you to that point? Um, and, and then we also mark incorrect solutions, right? Which may, not, may surprise you for an exam. Um, and there we give high marks for clear evidence of applying a problem solving process, for making progress, for doing sound reasoning and, and for explaining what you're doing well. So that is, um, that is how we do it. It is perfectly possible, to, and, and students did, to get a first class mark without solving the problem correctly. Um, that is because I don't really care if you can solve this particular puzzle. The thing that I'm trying to assess is whether you can approach solving unseen problems and whether you have a sensible way of doing that. Now, whether you happen to get to a solution in the perhaps half an hour you have in this exam, uh, 30 or 40 minutes or something, um, that you wrestle with this problem. If you happen to get to a solution, that's grand, good for you. But that isn't really the thing that I'm assessing. Um, and actually, what we noticed is it's a bit of a problem for students who just spot the solution instantly. They then slightly struggle to explain it in a way that shows that they've understood how to do problem solving, because that flash of in insight is sometimes hard to explain. Anyway, um, yes, so that's what would happen under normal circumstances, right? So then COVID happened. So this, well, a bit earlier than this time last year, um, the university decided to put exams in the 24-hour online format. Right? So students would have um, a, a start time and then until that time the following day to submit it. Um, this raised some problems for us um, and we decided not to run the exam in that format and we've stuck to that decision this year as well when the same thing happened. Um, the purpose of the exam is to test unseen problem solving skills and there is an issue with that if the students are able to communicate, if they have access to the internet, if they can start Googling around for things that might help them solve these puzzles. So that's not ideal. That's part of the reason that we made it an exam in the first place, is that we could get them in an environment where it was just them against the puzzle without any of these sort of extra resources available to them. And actually one really significant issue that we were worried about was we don't think the students are very often going to get to a correct answer in the time available, but in 24 hours, they may well keep banging their head against the screen until they you know, get to a solution. And that's not necessarily good because I don't really care if they get to a solution or not. I want to see that they're heading in the right direction in a 30 or 40 minute window. You know? So we decided not to run the exam in, in the online format. The question then is you've got this learning outcome. So what do you, how, how are you gonna assess it? Um, so if they aren't gonna demonstrate their problem solving skills in this way, what are we gonna do? So we wrote an exam replacement coursework. We took section A, because we'd already written the exam. We took section A from the exam and we put that in the coursework with an additional emphasis on checking that your work is correct, because we thought in a coursework environment versus an exam environment, there ought to be a little bit more, um, you know, you ought to be able to make sure that your, exam, that your answers are correct in some way, either using software, using a different method, et cetera, et cetera. And we wrote a new section B. Section B said, choose a question from last year's paper or two years ago's paper um, and write a narrative explaining or describing how someone who doesn't know how to solve this problem might attempt their solution. Okay, and, and you should use this opportunity to demonstrate your understanding of the steps in the problem solving process and give mathematical notes describing what the person might attempt and what the results might be. So the idea is that they're supposed to be demonstrating their ability to do this problem solving, but they haven't got a new problem to do it on. They're going to fictionalize somebody who doesn't know how to solve one of the, old, one of the puzzles from the past paper. Um, yeah, so that's what we came up with. Um, 
there are a couple of common approaches to this. So one, um, the sort of less good one, oh, I should say we gave them the answer, right? So we gave them the past paper and we gave them the answers to the past paper. So that then removes this issue of, you know, can they happen upon a solution online? Do they pass a solution around if they find one or whatever? Don't care because I gave them the solution. That's not a problem. What I'm interested in is the thing, the, the process and do they understand how to solve a problem like this? So a bunch of students, basically gave us an annotated version of the given solution, um, proceeding from one step to the other as though it was totally natural without really explaining what was going on. So they would just be sort of, and next, the problem solver happened to notice that this, that, you know, if I do this, then this happens. And then if I do this and then, and it's just like, well, you're just talking me through a piece of algebra or whatever, you know, you're not, you're not sort of telling me anything that's not already in the solution. You're just annotating it a bit. The much better, versions of this uh, used the solution that we'd given and sometimes in quite a contrived and um, sort of performative way to point out the bits of problem solving advice and how they would move the solution along. So they would write something like, you know, next the problem solver tries some smaller cases of this problem. And in doing so, they notice a pattern and they try and extend that pattern to the size of board that's been given in this question or whatever it is, you know, um, so that they're, they're sort of yeah, going through this process of saying, and now I'm going to do the next thing in the problem solving process. But that's sort of what they do in the exam as well. And that's kind of what we want them to do, because we want them to show us that they've learned how to do this um, skill that we're trying to assess, I suppose. Anyway, it seemed to differentiate students along the lines of the learning outcome. Um, so uh, a couple of questions that emerged then from this as we were as we were preparing this talk. I mean, one is, do we need an exam? Right. So we've run the module three times. Once we did it with an exam, twice we did it without an exam. We don't seem to have a problem um, giving the students grades. It's very hard to answer the question of whether um, whether students are, you know, is performing problem solving the same as kind of fictionalized narrative demonstrating problem solving. It's very hard to say whether the marks would be the same if you did both um, to the same group of students because we don't have that um, available to us. The other thing that occurred to us as we were writing these slides is this is elaborating a solution through the lens of problem solving heuristics, but you could do it to other in other lenses, if you like, you could ask for, you know, how does using MATLAB help you solve this modeling problem, or even how does you know, playing around with, you know, scratch work or whatever, um, help you with the process of, of proving this theorem or whatever, you know, you, I could imagine other cases in which, you know, the skill that you want them to demonstrate if they can articulate what that would be, even if they can't actually demonstrate it in this particular circumstance, might be a suitable way of doing coursework for some of these topics. Anyway, I have a reference, uh, which is our paper, and uh, thank you very much. And I think uh, back to Kevin. Okay, yes, thank you very much. That's uh, quite quite a novel solution there uh, to, to the exams, to, to give them the questions and the answers. Um, sure. Um, so I, I wonder if there's any questions for, for either of our past two speakers. There's, there are no open questions at the moment, so maybe because we're only slightly behind at the moment by, by maybe a couple of minutes, so we're doing quite well for time. Um, maybe I can ask a question. Did, did, you, did you actually try this out on them beforehand? Did you give them practice? Because you said that some of them didn't, they just kind of went through, you know, just put, putting a narrative to what you'd already given them. I mean, what what happened there? I mean, did did you give them a practice beforehand or I mean, we what? didn't? No, no. I mean, we gave them a um, we talked to them about what they might be expected to do, but no, we didn't give them a practice beforehand. Right, because it might be interesting to to see that to try and prevent this kind of. Mm. They're not quite sure what they do because this is entirely novel. I mean, I think yes. I might be a bit 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 worried about you know <laughs> what do I do in order to uh it's really hard the other thing we consider is giving them an exemplar but then they'll just copy you know mimic the exemplar and that's not necessarily useful either you sort of want to see what they're going to do for themselves don't you it is hard because you're not asking them to do the thing i mean this is what um tony's put in the chat you're not asking them to solve problems but in some ways how can you um with with any sort of you know i can't give you an unseen problem that you've never come across before and know for sure that you're not um you know, using a piece of software to help you solve it or looking it up online or something like that. It's very hard to uh, do that sort of thing. 
if I can't be sure that you've actually done it. Whereas this is this is kind of what well, and of course that happens with coursework all the time but here you're making very explicit this thing of well I, i'm not looking at whether you can solve this i'm not asking you to sort of pretend that you've solved this problem i'm asking you to um talk me through it of course in the in the talk content we had done um quite a few times through the year we'd gone through solving a problem as a class um we did we did our lectures we didn't do the recorded video thing we did a zoom room with breakout rooms and we um, you know so we put students into small groups and they worked through um, things they didn't really know how to solve and we talked about how the how the um, you know maybe drawing a diagram will help you get some insight into this problem or maybe you know all these different th things that you get from polya so they had had some practice with it in that sense and kind of all year I'd been saying this thing that I'm I'm interested in the whether you can solve problems not whether you happen to be able to solve this particular problem right okay um we uh, i was going to su suggest um, any, has anyone got any questions for mark um we we, we do have a, a problem with q and a's for for panelists when they want to ask questions they we, they can't use the q and a i don't i don't believe so um but uh, vesna who's one of the panelists says uh, it's basically asking what, what do the externals think of this i think that's what her question is um, so we haven't had our exam board for this year is in a week or two but last year the external was very happy with us yeah. Oh, for last year. But for last year, because we did it last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. We haven't had the panel for the uh, the oh. exam board for this year. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I, th I think we've got about a minute left. Left to the, um, the there is a, there is a question here. It says, Peter, do you not lose some nuances by eliminating the possibility of giving a wrong solution? I'd say first of all that we didn't eliminate the possibility of giving a wrong solution. We had some quite entertaining ones where. Like, how did you get it wrong? We told you the answer. <laughs> but, right. uh, but yes, I mean, potentially we didn't get that sort of uh, banging your head against the wall because you can't get there. But how do you deal with that? That whole, the aspect of problem solving that is being stuck and how do you cope with that? We didn't get any of that. You know, it's very hard to simulate everything, isn't it? Of course, you don't get that with every student anyway, because some will, some will just see it. I set a problem the first year we did this and you know, a quarter of the students just saw it instantly and then wrote a pretty poor answer because they just told us, ah, I've spotted this is the solution. <laughs> and that was it. And you think, well, all right, maybe you should have tried a different question because the point was not to solve the, the particular problem. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, well, I'd just like to give another quick round of applause there because I think we should take a break. So we'll, 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 we're planning for a 10 minute break. So at, um, that puts us six minutes behind. Um, so that's good. That's good going, I think. Um, so at uh, 2.21, we shall reconvene for the next set of talks. So uh, if everybody would like to just stand up, go and take a stretch, get away from the screen, very important. And uh, please be back at uh, uh, 2.21. And you can leave questions in the uh, Q&A, of course. If you, if you, um... But anyway, yes, have a break. Get some tea or something, some coffee.
Okay, I think uh, Kevin promised we would uh, all be back at uh, 221 and uh, I make that 221 certainly on my time Kevin hopefully that agrees uh, uh, roughly with yours as well so um, exactly with mine uh, so we move on to the uh, next block of, uh, of talks uh, for this afternoon session uh, and for the uh, the benefit of the tape uh, as they say it's great to be able to introduce uh, Jenny Hughes and uh, Dimitrios Roxanas uh, from the University of Sheffield, who are going to talk to us about uh, using Crowdmark for assessing handwritten student work. So Jenny, Dimitrios, over to you when you're ready. Lovely, thank you. So um, I'm going to be doing most of the talking today and um, Dimitrios is going to be monitoring the chat, answering some questions. We'll probably get through a little bit quicker than we said for the 20 minutes, so might get back on time. Um, but basically, what we're going to talk about today is this time last year, we would got through all the initial chaos and we were looking for something a bit better for assessing handwritten work than what we kind of cobbled together just to get us through initially. And part of that was that we were looking for what options we had out there. There weren't very many and we couldn't find examples of UK institutions that were using them. So today is a bit of a chance to be able to show people what we've been using this year because we went with Crowdmark, which is a Canadian company. They mostly are known in Canada and the US, not so much outside of there. So what I wanted to be able to see was how would this work in the wild in a UK institution? And we couldn't really answer that. Um, so I thought I'd talk a bit about that today um, and I'm a digital learning advisor, so I work mostly with faculty of science. Um, that's because I used to be a maths teacher, so I tend to quite like all of the kind of sciencey STEM subjects. Um, but Dimitrios will also talk about the perspective of actually using it to do marking on. So he'll be able to give you a little bit of the what it's actually like to do it for marking big numbers of assessments and kind of answer any questions about that. So the plan for today is what we're going to do, have a little bit of a look at how it works. So the setup and the marking features that we've got, and then the feedback from students and staff, because we did a pilot, we've got bits of information about how they got on with things. Okay, so I'm going to turn off my video now because um, I'm better at doing demos if I don't have to concentrate on trying not to pull a silly face. Um, and I'm going to take you into this, which is an assignment I've set up for today. So in here, when you go in, you're taken straight into the grading panel because generally that's what you're going to be going in for. I'll just show you quickly what my questions that I set up looked like. So I've got a few options. I've got an assignment description and some students really like to have the PDF that they can just download. Some of them even want to print it so that they've got all the questions in one place, work through them, upload them later. Um, and I can do that by putting it in here. If you recognize this, this is done in Markdown. Um, we can do Markdown and LaTeX in any of these questions. So my first question was an integral one and I'm expecting an image response or PDF file. We ask our students to do it by using Microsoft Office Lens because we found that that gives pretty good results where they scan things and you can see it as clearly as possible because they can do things like edit it to make sure that there's perspective correction in there, a little bit of making sure that the colors work well. So that tends to help make sure we get good things from the students. I'll show you a couple of examples using that in a minute when we start marking. Um, my next question, I've got one where they're gonna do a text response. And the last one, I've got multiple choice. So I've just done one of each question type. And if I go back here, I can go in and this overview grid is showing me that question three, the grading is complete. I didn't have to do anything there because it was multiple choice. That was all done for me. If there was a problem with it, I could go in and I can check them and I can look at what's been put and I can do things in there. But main point of a multiple choice question like that is that we want it automatically marked and to not have to do any marking, which is ideal. Um, and then I can see question one, 60% graded, two left. I can click on this and it'll take me straight in to the next unmarked question. 
so it tries quite hard to be helpful to you. Um, if anybody's ever marked for GCSE or A-level maths, um, quite similar to some of the systems that are used by the exam boards there. So here it's taken me straight to booklet five because that's the first unmarked one. And I've got tools down the left hand side. So I can go in and I can look and go, yeah, something's gone wrong here. And I could circle it. If that blue isn't showing up particularly well, I might want to change it to a red draw myself a question mark or if I don't want to draw the question marks because I do use question marks quite a lot often I can go in and I've got some stamps that I could put on like this um, we can also highlight with boxes but the thing that's most useful here is that there's a comment bank so I can go and I can type a comment in but on the left hand side here I've got all of these comments so every time I type a comment in it stores it in the comment bank for me so it's trying to make things as quick as possible so that instead of having to type out the same thing um, you'll notice from this question they've gone wrong with their negatives which pretty much you can guarantee is going to happen quite often on a question like this so I can set up some of these responses already so I've got one here that says careful with the negatives integration methods correct but you've gone wrong after substituting see oh but I've made a mistake so if I've made a mistake I can go in sort my mistake out click save and what will give me a chance to do is automatically update that for all of the other responses that have got that comment on. So if you were finding that students have made the same mistake again and again and again, and instead of just writing, you've made a mistake, you start to want to be able to say, you've made a mistake, please go back and watch this video and embed a link to the video, you can do that. So you can go back, you can edit any of your comments and I've imported all of these. So these comments have all come from a previous version of this. So that if you're doing the same assessment with multiple classes, or if you're just doing ones that are very similar where you're gonna be using the same sort of comments, you can import them in. If it's for just an assessment, assess piece of work where feedback isn't as important, some of the people in the department have been using comments like two slash 10 because what that does is it automatically adds the marks on the right hand side over here so I've got this automatically generated mark here where every time I drag a comment on it will add those marks up on the right hand side and if I go too far if it goes over the amount of marks it'll update that for me in amber to show that there's a bit of a problem so I can go back in and I can overwrite it clear it and have seven marks. So I've got quite a lot of features that I can use to be able to change things. If I want to set it up so that I've got it like this with the one slash 10, two slash 10, or if I want to set up a bit of a rubric, then I can go into the comment library and I can go in and I can edit them in here directly. So this one, one slash 10, I didn't put a mark on that. So I can go in, change that, put myself a mark in and again that will update all of the other instances so that it'll go back and if that's been used anywhere it'll just add it on to the previous ones so that it's doing that thing where you're halfway through marking you realize that you've been a bit mean or you've been a bit over generous and you have to go back and try and find all the ones that had that mark on with this I can find them a little bit quicker because it'll automatically update like that but I could also go up and filter evaluations and look for ones that have a score between say zero and five where I might think that I hadn't been generous enough or look at all of the ones that I gave 10 marks to to check that I'm happy with them. I've also got a few other things I can filter on so I'll just close for a second and show you where the tags are because over here I can put a tag on something um, and this was used quite a lot where for example there was a potential case of plagiarism somebody was a bit unsure because maybe the handwriting looked a bit odd or there was something a bit strange about it you can put in a tag that says check the students don't see those tags even when it's sent back to them but you can filter for all the ones that say check and you'll notice I've got this one here that says check, go through to the next unfiltered. Yeah, they look very similar. So 
I can go through and have a look at things and bring up just specific bits so I can find out a bit more about how the marking has gone with that. I'm going to go back to this question. And when I've finished marking a question, I can use shortcuts to get myself through to the next one. I can either do the next filtered or you know, clear filters or next ungraded along the bottom. Or what tends to happen if you're doing this for quite a lot of things, then you get used to using the keyboard shortcuts because there's quite a few useful ones in here that particularly helpful if you're just trying to get a mark on there without necessarily huge amounts of feedback. You can go through, type in your score, click enter, and it'll take you through to the next one. So if I click enter, it'll take me to my next unmarked one where again, I can drag and drop. And these comments, similar to when I was setting up the questions, they can have LaTeX in, they can have Markdown in, so I can pretty much include anything that I need in there with those comments. So if I put a link in, I can have a, li a clickable link using Markdown that can take students out to a video to watch so that they can go over things again. So it's now saying last ungraded booklet, which is great. And hopefully what should be happening here is that I go to the overview grid and I can see how everybody's got on with each of these. Because I'm doing it by question, there can be multiple people marking at the same time. So whereas if you had paper, you've got to be either trying to split them up by page or being able to kind of mark your questions, pass them to the next person, I can be marking question one, somebody else can be marking question two at the same time, and that doesn't cause any problems. We can also have multiple markers on the same question and then change who is the primary evaluator to say which is the one that we're going to keep the mark from, if that's something that's going to be useful. Okay, so if I've finished doing most of my marking, I can go back and I can have a look at the results you get a chance to export this takes it back into Blackboard for us. We can also download CSV files um, and we get a few bits of stats with things like distribution of scores. So we can see how people have done this one. Clearly, it's because this was the multiple choice question that was self marking. So they either got full marks or no marks. There wasn't really anything in between there. So we can go in and have a little bit of a look at how students have done overall. Okay, so I'll come back to any of this. If there's anything people want to ask questions about, you're welcome to put them into the chat at any point. Um, but really the thing which is probably quite interesting to see is what did staff and students actually think of this? So when we did a pilot, um, this was before it was released fully for the January exams. In November, we did a pilot. 108 of those students gave us feedback about how they got on with it. And it was really reassuring feedback because we were planning to use this for the January exams. So really wanted to know that it was going to be OK. 99% of them said it was easy to use. Uh, the one who said it wasn't, they put in the comments section that they were having problems trying to get the PDFs they'd made from their phone onto their computer. So we sent them a bit of information about that to try and help with that. Um, and 90% said better than the previous alternative. So what we'd had previously was Blackboard assignments. Um, and the reason they liked it better is they talked about being able to upload easier so you could have a JPEG or you could have a PDF and um, you could have multiple files or you could have one PDF and then split it up. It felt a little bit more natural to them to be able to see the individual questions and put things in the right places. They liked the fact that um, they could check what they'd submitted and if they noticed that there was a problem with it. So, for example, they'd taken the picture badly. Um, or they'd made a mistake in a question which they only saw when they uploaded it, they could go back in and resubmit all the way up to the deadline, which is something that 
the admin staff also really appreciated because previously students would submit and then send an email saying I've submitted entirely the wrong file it's all awful can you please fix this and they'd have to go in and fix it for the students whereas at least this way students could fix that problem themselves um, where they said that they didn't really like it um, we had the majority of them said that it was the same as the previous alternative they didn't really see it was better or worse the two that said that it was worse than the alternative um, it was because they didn't like having another system which is a very valid point um, but in the end having looked at all of the feedback we decided that it was worth the extra system given that the vast majority of students talked about some really good benefits for it and I've put on here from the physics staff student committee. This was in a discussion about what should we keep next year and unprompted they said that Crowdmark was so much better for submitting their weekly homeworks because it meant they didn't have to run up the hill. If you've been to Sheffield you'll know that everything is on a hill. Didn't have to run up the hill or up the stairs to get to hand it in and that they thought this was much better for accessibility reasons so that students didn't have to come in on a day when they might not already be in and it was easier for the disabled students. So that was quite a useful thing to be able to hear about that they found that it worked much better for them than the paper hand in there. In terms of staff feedback, we sent out a survey to staff who used it for the January exams um, and it tended to be that the course admin teams did the setup and then the academic staff did the marking. So we gave a chance to feedback on both of those sections. The staff who'd set it up talked about how much it had sped up the process and they were really, really pleased with it. They found it so much easier and more intuitive to set up. They could go in and they could find out information about the students. So I said about how um, students could resubmit up to the deadline, but also from a staff side, you can go in and you can see what time they accessed it. You can see when they tried to upload. You can see if an upload failed. You can find out all of that information, which is really helpful when students email you in a panic. Um, they could also submit on a student's behalf. So if a student had real problems for whatever reason, then they could just email the PDF and the member of staff could submit it on the student's behalf quite easily, which then just put it into the marking pool with everybody else and meant that it streamlined the process from there on. Um, in terms of marking, this was first time anybody had been using it. There were, I think, a couple of people who'd been involved in it in other institutions previously, but for the majority of staff, first time using it, first time using it with quite big cohorts for high stakes exams. So I would say the fact that we've got 53% who said that it sped things up is going very well. Where people talked about slowing it down, some of that, we did ask for it to be in comparison to Blackboard assignments, but the comments did say quite a lot about would rather mark on paper. So I think there was some amount of people saying that they would rather go back to paper-based marking and that's what they were comparing it to. But also 20% the same. So we've got 70 odd percent who are saying it's the same or it's sped things up with the admin staff saying that they liked it a lot more and the student feedback being pretty positive too. So for a first run through, I was really happy with that because we don't expect anything to be perfect absolutely nothing will suit everybody um, and we are going to be talking about sort of going into next year what things are kept what things change around and trying to give a chance for things which work for different people so that we acknowledge that one size doesn't ever really fit all okay so in the staff feedback the kind of written bits and the anecdotal bits so Demetrius helps quite a lot with this talking about kind of what he'd heard around the department. We also got things from um, sessions that we've run. It didn't line up with all our procedures and systems. So there were various frustrations about things like they use um, email addresses, the unique identifier, whereas we'd like to use student number. Um, we wanted to be able to have 
groups, but that wasn't something we could have straight away. Um, it just didn't always quite do exactly what we expected it to. But what I would say about that, um, particularly with the groups bit, I've put an asterisk on that one. Um, Crowdmark were brilliant at helping with that. So where we had some issues, where some things didn't work, they gave us a lot of support in terms of finding either workarounds or in some cases, developing entirely new things for us, which is something that we don't get from all of our suppliers. So really appreciated that from them. Um, the annotations can be a bit clunky. My handwriting is terrible at the best of times, so I didn't actually do any writing today, but because it's online, it's never going to be quite as smooth as it would be if you're using sort of a PDF app on your computer or on your phone or tablet. It's never going to be quite as smooth. It is always going to be, well, actually the problem is sometimes it is more smooth that it's been made into curves where you maybe wanted it to be a little bit more kind of angled um, you can't resize the scripts so we can't zoom in at the minute um, but you can generally get around that quite well using your browser to be able to zoom in um, and you can't mark homework as it comes in so you have to wait until you've got all of them in although I did work with Demetrius on this and we found a way around that that you can make it a timed assessment that means you can start marking earlier which is useful but what worked? Quite a lot of things. Um, marking by question is much quicker and more intuitive than having to mark an entire paper all in one go. But you could move up and down. So if you wanted to see what they'd put for question one, you could actually go find that quite easily by just scrolling up. So it's nice to mark by question because it also means that where we have GTAs on some of the courses, there's a big engineering course um, and they use GTAs really well to mark by question. Um, the reusable comments is great for saving time, dragging and dropping things on. The tags have helped a lot in terms of the admin staff being able to go in and find things. We're looking at different ways of using those tags as well for the checking process at the minute, which they're quite useful for just being able to do that filtering and finding quickly. The automatic totals means that there's slightly less of the worrying about whether you've added it all up correctly, although still do say that you need to check that because the automatic totals will be going from the bits on the comments, so needs a little bit of checking. Um, yeah, and being able to grade the files waiting for instructions at the end. So there's no manual entering. You're not having to go in and just enter everything individually. So um, I said I'd try and be a little bit quicker, but um, next steps is what I always put on my slides when I'm delivering training. Um, it's maybe a little bit different today, but you've got a chance to ask questions. I've not looked in the chat and I'm gonna go through that now. Um, but there's also, we have some videos. So there's two videos on our website, one from a kind of student side, which talks through how students submit, one from a staff side. And they're quite useful for being able to kind of see how it works from kind of both sides, if you want to go back to look at anything quickly. Um, if you want to get in touch later, I've only put my email address on there because it was easier to just put the one, but I can pass any questions on to Demetrius as well. He's happy to answer them. Um, or I'm on Twitter, you can ask questions on there. And you can get in touch with Crowdmark. They're absolutely lovely, really very helpful. Um, so they get back to you pretty quickly so that you can ask them anything if you want demos. Um, let me go and have a little bit of a look in the chat, I think it looks like Demetrius has been doing a great job of fielding questions. Um, he'll come in and answer some now as well, if there's anything. Brilliant. Thank you very much for, for, for that, Jenny. Uh, I think, uh, tell my round of applause there. Um, I think just to take a quick question for me before we, we move on to the, the next one, uh, which has come in from, from Ben, which is an interesting question because I think the sort of grade, uh, so there's crowd mark and grade scope. And uh, Ben was just wondering, have you done any comparison of the two? Okay, so yes, we did look at both. 
Um, and I spent quite a bit of time playing around with both. I had a lot of fun with that, actually. It was great. This is one of the good bits of my job where I make silly questions and play around with them. Um, in the end, we went with CrowdMark because a bit because of practicalities. Um, what I would say is I'm incredibly pleased with our choice. Um, it has worked out really well. They've been very responsive to us in terms of working with us on differences between Canadian and UK needs, um, which has been quite a big thing. It's, yeah, it's not something we always get from suppliers. So the fact that they've been so good on that has been massively helpful. It's meant that we've been able to, where there's an issue, fix it fairly quickly usually, which has been nice. Um, we haven't got... Well, we have got some information about the comparison. I don't know whether I'd be able to share that, but I'm definitely happy to have conversations with anybody if you're at an institution that's looking at it. Um, I think somebody asked about pricing, and that's one that we're definitely not allowed to tell people about because same with most of the tools that we have, um, we can't say how much different institutions pay for them. But if you get in touch with them, then they'll talk to you about what your requirements are with that. Um, brilliant. Thanks, Jenny. I think we probably need to move on to, if that's okay, on to, to, to Charles now. But uh, uh, thank you both to, to you and, and, and Dimitros. If, if you wouldn't mind kind of answering any the remaining questions in the chat, that would be brilliant. But yeah, thank you for, for a fascinating overview um, of, of your use of, of uh, uh, Crowbark there. Brilliant. So, Charles. Hello. Yeah, I can uh, share my screen and get started if yeah good. brilliant I'll, uh, I'll just do the as i say the introduction for the tape um as it goes oh, okay. you, you have the award for the most sort of sustainable um uh, title today with the uh, well your, your ideas for online teaching but the one in the program the reduce reuse and uh, and recycle so uh, charles were you ready over to you oh, thank you and thank you very much for letting me speak at this uh conference even if we are online it's a uh, it's nice to be able to share some things and the talk so far have been really interesting. So I'm, I feel rather lonely uh, <laughs> with this talk because many people have had other people with them to talk. Uh, I will try and keep an eye on the chat um, and feel free to type in the chat throughout the talk. Uh, so if, if people want to type hello in any language, I, Kevin kind of did this earlier. So I, he got there first, but feel free to type away during the talk. And I will also try and answer questions after the, uh, that are in the Q&A afterwards. Right, so very quick uh, intro to me. So these slides I'll make available. Um, they're in the abstract and I can type them in the chat afterwards. Basically, I do lots of different kinds of teaching and that's what this slide is for. Uh, I forgot to start my timer but I'll try and keep to the 15 minutes. And my aim with five topics in 15 minutes is that I'm kind of gonna give five lightning talks. So for each thing, I'll try and indicate why I was doing it or why I think it's a good idea. Um, something that was unexpected as a good point about it. And then something that wasn't so good and maybe how I resolved that. Um, these, it's nice to do things in threes, which is why like to do it in this way. So a sort of warning to start with is that it's, uh, it's, it seems very difficult to disentangle what is really the best practice or what's good practice and what's just style. And so I, I can't promise that the, these five things will be good practice. And I can't even promise that they'll be good style. <laughs> so uh, I hope you enjoy them anyway. And um, uh, the aim is that they're maybe reusable, which is one of the aims for this conference. Right, so the aim is to be reducing workload by reusing some ideas or questions and recycling old things and old questions and so on. Uh, so this is the first thing. So this is a screenshot um, and I found, I, I used Zoom. I mean, other things are rather similar in what they offer, but for getting an idea of what students are thinking, uh, you can prepare something rather fancy like this question, uh, or, and then allow students to annotate the screen, or you can just have a true false style question, which is very quick, 
And so on Zoom, you can then allow people to annotate the screen and students can then be voting live. So they're like ticking what they think the answers are. And I'll explain good and bad things about this. So uh, you can also then show them what the answers are. And what's the idea? So students are using the annotate function. It's some, what it's based on is just some student interaction. It's quite nice to get chat from students, but um, sometimes you, as was illustrated, I suppose, by my saying to say hello, you generally don't get that many responses. And if you've got a larger group, then getting student interaction can be really quite difficult. And an unexpected benefit of just doing this, so I use polls, but then I use this, put up a true false style question. And an unexpected benefit was that it's, it's actually quite fun. Um, <laughs> and you see all these ticks or smiley faces and things appear on the screen as you're going, which is, which is good because students can see that everyone is contributing. Um, and an unexpected issue, of course, if they're all contributing, then some of them are getting the wrong answers. And uh, a previous Talmo speaker in another Talmo uh, conference said about then putting students into breakout rooms to get them to discuss their answers. And they said it didn't work. And I thought, well, yeah, it didn't work for me either. I would put the students into breakout rooms and I did this in the first session and they would come back and the voting wouldn't change. So what was the resolution to this? Um, now, in some of the other talks today, there have been other solutions and I think they're very good. Uh, my simple solution was just to not tell them the correct answer, but to give them an example to think about. And that example would be intended to highlight what the correct answer was. So again, this is style or is it good practice? Is it best practice? I'm not sure, but this, uh, this, this is what I did for it. Okay, so these numbers, this is talk number two. Um, they're very small down here and they're all quite small numbers as well. And these numbers, they're all minutes uh, for those particularly eagle-eyed people. Um, these are the video lengths for my videos that I made for teaching. Um, so the idea is what video lengths would you like? And these are all very short in minutes. Uh, and what was I basing it on? Well, I know there's some research that says shorter video lengths are beneficial because students have shorter attention spans. Um, and the main reason was to be able to introduce each topic because every single video could have a title and also to get students to reflect on what I've covered, because hopefully it, rather than just listening and being this passive observer, you can be thinking, okay, I, I've, we've done that definition now. And an unexpected benefit was it was useful for a revision for students because it had everything in topics. And an unexpected issue was students complained a bit, well, they, there were some comments by students saying that the video service we used didn't offer um, a you have watched this sort of service as YouTube does. So hello, YouTube. Um, and this was a problem, but I think that indicated that if a student doesn't know whether they've watched the video on the definition of a group, then they probably haven't got good enough notes from the video on what a definition of a group is. So I wish I'd made gaps notes to, to fix that. And I did, as a solution, make um, some a PDF that tried to do this, but I wish I'd done it at the beginning. So that's point number two. And this is what the course looked like. So it was broken down by weeks in folders. I had the first six weeks of the course. And each week it says the things that they're going to cover. And then in a given week, so this is week one, um, it has, we, this is Blackboard, and it uses learning, I use learning modules, and then all the videos are in each of these. And this is then, within the learning module, this is what it looks like. So this is the first one, definition of a group. And one thing I tried to do as well, which is this point three, is that for the videos, I like, I, I try to break them up with questions. So before and after a video, which is very short, I think this is a four minute video, um, to have some questions to get students to reflect on what they're covering, what they're seeing. And also exercises between them and quizzes. So Blackboard quizzes are quite 
reasonably easy to make and you're sort of reusing questions that you would have in the notes in some cases. So what's it based on? Well, I just want to get them to reflect on what they're doing and not just watch the video seamlessly. Otherwise, there's no point in having them as small videos. Um, a benefit was that the it made me think about why the course was set up in, it, in the way it was. So it's the first time I'd ever lectured this course and it made me think, well, why are we covering this definition? And when should we cover it? Because you've, you've not got this seamless flow of a 20 minute video or whatever. Um, and having these quizzes and questions between makes you think about what you want students to reflect on. Uh, I I had low uh, usages for in about the second week for some of the quizzes and I couldn't understand why. And this is because Blackboard hides them by default. But the the other issue, the main issue really, was that I would make the link up between these non-assessed quizzes and the weekly homeworks really clear because not, neither of them are for credit. And the quizzes can be used for certain types of questions. And so those types of questions, I tried to, I could then try to avoid in the homework questions. And that's what I've said I'll do for next time. So what's the idea? Um, can you, by sort of pausing between the videos, can you make your uh, course feel a bit more like one-to-one -one tutoring? And that's why it's really interesting with Thomas's first talk about how they try to do this by actually having a person there to listen to them. All right, so th this is uh, point three of five. So we've done three lightning talks. Uh, this is another thing that I'd like, I'm, I'm gonna reuse, which is how the course begins. So I'm sure like a lot of people, in a mad rush to make videos at the beginning of the course. And the beginning of a course is generally recapping things that are that students are expected to know from prerequisites. And you've realized you need to deliver a, a lot of content, but recapping lectures are, are really qu quite a difficult thing in some sense, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to recap maybe half of a 12 week course uh, that they'll need for your course. And you're trying to do that in a week. So, and bearing in mind as well, some of these students, if, if they're coming in and the average is, let's say, 60% from the prerequisite, then that means they didn't understand maybe a third of the content from the prerequisite. So covering it very quickly in a one week or two week recap is something that I'm not going to do in the future. Um, and I'm going to use the videos to do this. So there's a lot to recap. And my plan is to do, so I, I'm I lectured uh, Linear Algebra 2, which is a second year course. And my plan is within that, the example of the space of polynomials and the spaces of functions are very important. So my intention is that I will just introduce those examples and find things like linearly independent sets and bases and span, whether they span and so on. Um, and I will, and dimension. And if students are unaware of some of those words or what I'm doing, I can give them the videos that I made this year. So that's one of the things I'm going to do. And so what's the idea? More and more elaborate animation and about how we can use these videos for the future. And then this could be a talk on its own, really. <laughs> uh, what? Why do we have small group teaching in mathematics? And I think the delivery of lectures, many people are saying they're going to flip their classrooms and that actually the online can be beneficial in replacement of lecturing. I think small group teaching is particularly difficult to do in the online setting. And so I just wanted to comment on what I did before, which was I really want students talking to each other and thinking about things in the course. So we have tutorials and this is for a second year tutorial, which is about a group of 25 students. So these are notes for me, and then I would write up the headings for these uh, on the board before as students were coming in. And then I would add some extra details and basically explain the questions that I wanted them to do. 
So when I moved to online, I did something very similar. I had, I shared a, an iPad screen. Uh, I had a warm up just as I'd have a warm up over here. I've just cut it off the plan. And I'd give them some questions and talk them through what I'd want them to do. And then they'd, they'd work individually or maybe in groups if they live together, but they'd work on them. And so one thing I changed with this is basically I changed from this plan uh, by, and I think I'll, I'll cover this in a, in a bit, but I, I changed instead of doing the interaction in this way where each of them can't speak to each other, I did this instead. So I, I wrote out the same sort of plan, but in more detail. And then I shared this PDF with the students and put them into breakout rooms. So they have a warm up problem that they come in and work on and they can ask, it basically tests the key ideas they'll need for the session. And then they were in breakout rooms for the whole session. And so that's why I'm saying here, how much can be prepared beforehand? Well, you can write out this whole document before which means you can share a lot of information with the students. And then you can also, I made videos that went through the solutions of these that I released after the session. So in that way, students can reflect on what they've covered. And uh, this was based in part on the way that we have run some writing workshops at Bristol and the people involved uh, in those writing workshops are these people down here. Right, so what's the idea? Um, what would you like from a small group session? So I'm, I haven't got the minute. I knew I would use up my time and not have the minute. But as a, as a plenary, as a thing to get people to reflect on, um, you could have a think, the five things that I've mentioned and which might you adapt because you might already have some of these resources yourself. And there might be other talks today about um, how people deliver their small group teaching or their lectures and how you might use those. So a few final other ideas. Um, as students come in, saying hello to them seemed to be a, a nice way to start. Sometimes they, you'd never see their face throughout the whole sessions, but uh, them having a question to work on as they come in and being just saying hello based on the name that they give in Zoom just seemed a nice way to start things. Uh, when they're in the breakout rooms, I would type and chat to them and I'd also pop in and see them. And at the end of the session, I'd then pull everyone back into the main room and maybe use something like the uh, on the off the cuff uh, poll of writing something and letting, letting them annotate to say how they feel about things or which questions they preferred or what things we'd covered. So these are the five things and that's the end of my time. So thank you very much for listening. Brilliant. Many, many thanks indeed, Charles. Uh, again, tell my uh, round of applause. And uh, thanks for kind of a really sort of reflective talk. I, I think uh, you've kind of put into words a number of things that people have been sort of playing through their minds about you know, how might we, we, we do this differently. And I think thanks also for the plugs to previous Talmo events and, and clearly some ties here with the things that Mark and, and, and Thomas in particular were talking about. So fantastic, thank you. Um, I don't see any questions in the uh, Q&A, but if anyone's got anything, please do uh, drop them in for, for Charles. But Charles, if I may ask one that continues the reflective theme, that imagine you could kind of parachute yourself back to uh, this time last year. What would you tell yourself? What would you do differently? Or what would you tell yourself based upon the experience of this year? OK, yeah, this <laughs> feels like an interview question. <laughs> but, um, uh, well, I mean, one thing is that the changing of the tutorial format, I was, I felt that was quite a risk because I just, in week six or seven, so about halfway through the second term, I just thought, well, I'm going to try this because I'd much rather just have them in breakout rooms working on things than watching me just sat there waiting for them to work on their own. So uh, I, it would have been quite easy to apply that from week one. Um, I was surprised as well. I didn't, I don't think I really lost any students doing that. So um, they, and on, I should have really had a feedback thing as well and saying that this, I mean, I, I, I know people are going to say this on a, on an online setting, but I, I didn't include feedback as an oversight really. I, I didn't think about putting it in there, but the students were very positive about this putting into breakout rooms business 
for the tutorials for the whole tutorial um so that would be one thing and i suppose it was difficult with the lecturing because i hadn't um lectured the course before so it's, it's always difficult when you inherit a course to know what you'll do with it um but yeah i suppose knowing these five things would have helped <laughs> but the talmo event actually did did cover some of the ideas that we could have for teaching because that was why talmo started right yeah, we'll, we'll make sure you get your payment later because that's another plug. Thanks, thanks, Charles. But uh, Jessica's just sort of posted in the um, in the chat about uh, students, their students absolutely hating breakout rooms. And I think this is the one big challenge I think we've all found online is how we kind of get that interaction. And it's perhaps easier to be a bit bit more anonymous. So I think I, I agree as well in a, with that, because I said earlier that I tried putting them into breakout rooms for a few minutes to get them to discuss stuff. And they did seem to hate that. But when it's the same group every week and you can put them into groups, they seemed a bit happier on that. So I don't I don't know. I think small group teaching is something that's really very difficult to do online. And, and can be challenging in, in real life as well. But yeah, yeah you can do so on, online. Uh, brilliant. Thanks again for, for, for that, Charles. Please do post any co uh, questions or, or, or tag uh, Charles in and, and I'm sure we'd be happy to, to respond. But again, yeah, thank you for for a great, uh, great reflective talk. Uh, we now go into uh, a couple of, uh, of lightning talks. Uh, we have uh, James Preston up first uh, from the University of Nottingham, um, and then followed by Ovidu Bagdasar, I hope I, I said that correctly, from the University of Derby. Uh, what we'll do, we'll take questions uh, at the end. Uh, so James, when you're uh, when you're ready, I'm particularly looking forward to this because apparently you're going to tell us how to all become millionaires. If I've read the abstract, well, <laughs> uh, perhaps maybe. I just read it. But if we're good at maths, maybe. Uh, who wants to be a millionaire? Style um, sort of revision consolidation quiz is what you're going to uh, talk about. So whenever yes. you're ready, uh, can I just check that you can see the screen? Has it shared? Yeah, we can. Excellent, brilliant. Thank you. So, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, as you said, I'm James Preston, and I work at the University of Nottingham. And I've used this resource on the foundation year at uh, University of Nottingham. I've used it fairly recently, actually, just before uh, the exam marking seasons all kicked off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how it would work. And then I'm going to kind of go through a couple more details that you should know as someone who's going to use it. Uh, I've put in the chat a link to a polling site where I'm going to ask some of you to pop an answer uh, as if you were a student doing the quiz. OK. So I'm just going to, there's a bit of a, a preamble. I'll come back to that in a second, but I'd like to show you what it looks like first of all. So question one, questions start off nice and easy, like in the show, and get progressively more difficult, like in the show. The first question is a nice, easy dot product question. Can you calculate the dot product between these two vectors? And can you pop your answers into the poll that I've, I've sent out? Regarding this part, it would help. It's not necessary, but it would certainly help if you had a second monitor, because with Menti, Mentimeter, uh, you can see the answers coming in real time, and therefore you'll get a feel for when you think students have all submitted, uh, so that you can then move on and use your time a bit more efficiently. So let me show you what I can see. So these are the options, and there's still a few coming in. C is the overwhelming majority. So I would say we're gonna go collectively for option C. Okay, and you can, you can cut that off when, you've, when you think you've had enough. Uh, so we would go for C. So I just click this blue button here and 100 pounds, we've got it correct, wonderful. What I've also then done is I've set up all the incorrect answers so that they are based on common mistakes. So it does take a bit of time to get this set up, but I definitely think it's worth it. Uh, for example, a lot of students do this kind of mistake or this kind of mistake where they multiply component by component and get a vector, whereas their answer should obviously be a scalar because it's a scalar product. So C is the correct answer. And I've got a document for my use next to me on my other screen, just so that I can see which answer is the correct one, just so I can get a feel for if students are getting it right on on the uh, on the spot 
This one that's shaded pink would be the one that I would keep if it was 50-50, if the 50-50 option had been asked for. Okay, then we've gone to question two. Uh, I won't get you to answer question two, but I'd like to just return to Mentimeter. I'm not sure if all of you have used this before, but it's really easy to use. It's quite colorful. I really like it. It, was, it takes minutes to set up one of these problems. You can then just copy and paste this into the chat uh, of the, the class that you're teaching. And once you have um, finished the question, you can just recycle this slide by clicking on the, if you kind of move your mouse around, you get some options. Click on the more option and then choose reset results. You can then reuse this uh, the slide again for each question. And this is good because Mentimeter only gives you two slides per presentation on the free version, but you can get around that for this kind of problem um, using that recycling idea. So then we'd go on to question two. Uh, I don't know if you can hear them, but there are some kind of sound effects from the show that are um, embedded in. You may or may not want to use those, but it just adds a bit more, a bit more fun to it. Uh, I think this one is B. So you click the blue circle for B. Happy days, 200 pounds. Uh, again, I've got some answers that are based on plausible mistakes that students could make, just to make it a bit more uh, useful as a revision exercise. Because if you did get one of these answers wrong, you can then see what you've done wrong and you can look back at your work and think, oh yeah, silly me, I get it now. Uh, you can share this document with students at the end uh, on, on whatever platform you use to share resources, just so they, they can see all the options and why some of them were wrong. Uh, if you get a question wrong, I'm gonna just guess one and hope that it's wrong. You'll get a little game over screen. Hopefully that won't happen, it could happen. Uh, I used this in January or December uh, with a different module and <laughs> on like question two or three, which was meant to be one of the easy ones, more than half of the students were going for one of the kind of obvious mistakes. So I was, I was kind of, I didn't really want to get the game over screen straight away. So I, it's up to you whether you want to do this or not, but I um, steered them like with heavy hinting that that might be incorrect, but it's up to you whether you want to do that or not. Now I'm going to return to the preamble because I'd, I'd like to just talk through that in a bit more detail. Uh, so this, uh, it's up to you whether you want to use this or not, but I've said you can use your notes, but you shouldn't be allowed to use Wolfram or Desmos. This is more kind of based on the fact that in the future we might return to exam hall exams where they haven't got access to the internet. Uh, now, obviously in the show, it's meant to be one person in the hot chair, and then the audience is a lifeline. But that, I thought that was quite difficult to implement on in an online setting. You may want to do that if you're feeling bold when we return to face-to-face. -to -face. Uh, but I thought it was easier and maybe more effective to have the whole student body being the person in the hot chair as a collective. And I've then replaced the ask the audience lifeline with phone a friend, uh, sorry, ask the presenter, so they would then ask me for a hint on how to solve the problem. If you're lucky in that you've got some PGR students who help you on your module, you might be able to recruit one as a phone a friend lifeline. So I had Celine who was present and we asked her for a hint, um, uh, should that lifeline be asked. Uh, lifelines can only be used once, so maybe save them until the end, or for the harder questions that is. Uh, a bit of, a bit of um, preamble about how I would pick the option that I would choose to uh, progress. I would choose all of the lifeline options as a collective. So here there are seven students asking for a lifeline. That's not as high as B, so I would choose B. B and C, I've got the same, so I would wait for another student to uh, answer. You'll probably find that not all students will want to use the Mentimeter, but if you kind of cajole them, then they might uh, bite the bullet and do it. In this case, I've got 15 students wanting a lifeline, which is more than the 12 who asked for B. So I would say more students want a lifeline. So we'll go with a lifeline. 
And the lifeline that's the most popular is 50-50. So we would apply 50-50, you would then reset the voting and you would start again with that new information. Uh, more or less it. I will just kind of show you what this document looks like. So I've got all of these uh, sort of the question, what the question is, what the answers are, what the mistakes are, what the correct answer is, and which option to keep for 50-50. And I've just print screened that onto the PowerPoint. Um, what else? Uh, oh, I have made a template of this that I will share with the gang afterwards, where it's got the kind of backbone of the PowerPoint, but the, um, the questions are all blank, ready for you to fill in. And I'll also include uh, a list of which of the blue buttons are correct for each slide as well. Uh, in, in terms of getting student feedback on this, I haven't bothered yet, mainly because the uh, attendance was so poor uh, towards the end of the year. I'm hoping that I was just an endemic thing for everyone, but uh, I might do in the future. But, uh, a few students said on Teams afterwards that they really enjoyed it, so I took that as uh, positive. But uh, yeah, I'll stop there because I think I've, I've run over about seven minutes. So thanks for listening. And any questions, please just pop them in the chat and I'll try and get around to them. Brilliant. Thank you very much, James. No problem. Thank you for having me. Oh, pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Uh, please don't go anywhere yet. We'll, we'll bring. Yeah, you I'm, I'll stay right here. Give, give people time to, to to tap them in. Um, but now, uh, if we can bring in uh, Ovid Ovidu uh, Bagdasar, uh, who is going to, if I just pull up my uh, my program or the title there, going to talk to us about interactive teaching and social learning in a computational uh, class, classes. So uh, Ovidu, uh, when you're ready, over to you. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you very much uh, for having me today. I'm very happy to be in this event. Uh, congratulations to the organizers for setting all this up. I think it's a great idea. Uh, I'll try to start uh, uh, with my talk. Uh, so I, I'd like to present some items related to the COVID adaptations for my computational mathematics course. I'm teaching this course at the University of Derby for a number of years. I think it went uh, very well uh, before COVID. And then I felt that during COVID, I, I wanted to make some adaptations, especially in terms of interactive learning uh, and also social learning. Um, I wanted to give some mottos as well to, this session, to my session. Uh, I think especially in this course, education is not the feeling of a pill, but the lighting of a fire. And because my class is quite big, I have lots of students who feel demotivated. Most of them hate mathematics. This is their only maths course they that they have to take as computing students. And I try to make this experience enjoyable and valuable for their studies. Uh, so I have to fight an uphill battle and that's why I try to provide all the support I can. And uh, in terms of adaptations, I improved my interactive note taking with OneNote, in, uh, with the OneNote notebook. Then uh, at the university, we had uh, a training provided to all staff, the best of blends. And uh, this is where I've realized the value of, uh, of uh, social learning. And to improve social learning in my class, I, I decided to use live polls in the Blackboard Collaborate. I've, I've been using uh, recordings before as well. Also this year, I refined and deployed numeracy training courses, uh, which are self-study resources, because I had uh, questions about Pythagoras theorem and about lots of basic things. I have students who come back into education after 15, 20 years and they try to get a, a career change. And uh, I wanted to have uh, like 10% of their grade is two numeracy training courses developed in collaboration with another Canadian company. And also this year I, uh, I started to use peer learning in MS Teams. So I'll show you some, uh, some uh, information about how this works. Uh, in our best of blends uh, model uh, adopted the university, at the university, each student was provided with three hours on site, but all uh, the teaching for my course uh, took place online. Now, a uh, quick presentation of my class. This is the only maths module for year one computing students. I have to cover lots of uh, topics uh, like set theory, logic, linear algebra, vector operations, uh, matrix operations, a bit of complex numbers, some elements of graphs, some number theory, uh, my class numbers, I've seen the class size is relative. So I've seen the classes, bigger classes in, this pre in earlier presentations, but this was a class of uh, 150 plus students I had to deal with uh, on my own. NSS feedback uh, when I picked up the course in 2012 
was about 50%. I was able to bring that up to 90% and above uh, by preparing a textbook, e-assessment in Blackboard uh, until now, but this year I'm going to move on a different platform also provided by a technology partner. Uh, I adopted e uh, open book assessments available multiple times and um, I had to develop about 800 questions at the start, but I think it paid off uh, in the long run. And also I've been using, uh, since it was available by not recordings and math jokes uh, on a regular basis, I think this seemed to improve uh, student experience on a year by year basis. Uh, I think uh, we had a good engagement, high, very high overall satisfaction, but uh, now I had to adapt these things for COVID. Uh, to just give you a flavor of my cohort, uh, I have uh, feedback like this in mid semester feedbacks, uh, post exam feedback. So I sucked at maths. I was barely scrapping a C, but now I enjoy it. So I, I want to make my class enjoyable. And I think engagement for me is the key. And uh, now the first, uh, the first uh, improvement was interactive note teaching and uh, Blackboard Collaborate polls. Uh, I have uh, my, my teaching materials and recordings available in Blackboard as well, but I've also set up a OneNote notebook. And I have weekly sessions. Uh, you can see I have one uh, big lecture and then uh, five tutorial groups. Uh, the first lesson I learned uh, during this pandemic year was when I, had to, when I gave my first lecture. Charles mentioned before that we should say hello to the students. This is exactly what I've done. And then I've received like in the chat like 70, 80, uh, instant messages with notification sounds. Hello, how are you? Good morning and so on. So the first lesson I learned was to mute, mute chat notifications. Then I managed to get uh, two PhD uh, teaching assistants who helped me set up polls. And uh, with these polls, I was able to get the students on board such that in, in some, uh, in some um, revision sessions, so I, I have, I divided the course into four parts and for each part I have uh, a computer-based uh, exam, a computer-based test. And uh, I have a revision session for each of these tests. And when I, I, I take the test together with the students, I have enough many questions so that students get the same type of exam, the same type of test, but with different questions every time. So same, same content, but different numbers. So they are algorithmically generated. And this means that I can solve the test with them and then they can take it again and again. And then they, this is how they, they get their final grade. And uh, with the aid of uh, computer-based polls, I was a, of collab Blackboard Collaborate polls, I was able to get zero no responses. So 100% engagement in quite a few classes. And this was engagement in each of the questions of the test. And then of course, uh, this was with promises with these kids and so on. But uh, it, I think in, in terms of engagement, it went really well. Then I was shocked to see uh, students' feedback uh, through on blogs, the official blogs of the university. I had a student, I didn't know about uh, his other activities, but he popped his, this link into my lecture chat. And this was uh, uh, his uh, write-up about his experience on my class. And uh, I, uh, yeah, I felt uh, great. Uh, and then I realized how the students felt engaged by what I was doing. So I think this was, uh, this was really good. I will uh, provide uh, all these links. Uh, all these links can be uh, found in the, in the slides. Now, the second problem I tried to solve uh, during this pandemic year, I started to work on this earlier, uh, was uh, about numeracy skills courses. Uh, numeracy is the, the ability to understand and work with numbers. It's key for problem solving and employability. And I think we don't normally deal with this problem much in our mathematics classes. However, I think there is a big problem with the lack of math support for the students not taking STEM courses. And uh, it seems that only about 16% of the adults are numerate. And I think this is a real problem for the society. And I've been working with a Canadian-based company called Vreta to develop numeracy training courses for all the students and staff in our university. And two of those courses are deployed in my computational mathematics class. So the course is D1 and D2. And these courses have a modular structure based on topics. And each of the topics is made of diagnostic assessment, upgrading modules, which are, which are uh, interactive videos uh, with, uh, with uh, tasks, and then summative assessment. And then based on this, I give them a grade. And especially students coming from uh, 
but coming back to education found them really beneficial and the pass rate increased. Normally I had pass rate in my course 85% and now this went up to 90%. So I was happy with the outcome in my class, but now these courses, so I can use dashboards to give students feedback only using three, three of the elements in the dashboard. I can, I can tell the engagement, the engagement was 174 students out of 173. So I had engagement 100, uh, higher than 100%. Now the secret is that this was students left on the course. I started with 180 this year and seven uh, vanished due to W14s and so on. But uh, I can see that the engagement is very high. Uh, then I can see how many students do really well in the course. So they, they completed all the summatives to uh, with a grade above 80%. And I also, this year, we developed digital badges with our uh, Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching. And I awarded more than 400 badges for the completion of these numeracy courses across the university. And I've got my badge too. You can see how they look like. I think this is great for digital employability. And in order to support the university as well, we, did, we developed 10 numeracy training courses and also another course uh, based on basic numeracy skills. This is now taken by NASBET, the National Association for School-Based Teachers. So they take a similar course with 6,000 uh, uh, users. We integrated these courses with Blackboard. They can be deployed in modules, in, pro in programs as well. And it's also available through the Maths Hub. And uh, the last improvement I'd like to, to mention is social learning with uh, MS Teams. MS Teams uh, allows uh, uh, like social media, like uh, communication, Insta communication. I can tag my class and they all get the notification. Uh, we have feedback from students that many of them don't use uh, email too much and uh, they found uh, Teams uh, to work better. Uh, I can have focus communication. I can have uh, uh, channels for each of the uh, test components, for each of the assessments. And uh, th this is how I can communicate live with the students. The downside is that had, I had to add 180 students manually, but I think it was worthwhile. I could collect feedback from students as well very effectively. Uh, I could post announcements and make sh be sure that the students uh, read them. and. Uh, Yes, I think the real benefit of this uh, of this aspect, uh, for, and the, the reason why I want to keep it uh, after uh, from in, from next year onwards as well, is that I realized that I've invited all students to post their questions because the questions were automatically generated. I asked them to post questions, and before I could see, so the, a question posted the posted the a, a, a student posted a question at nine p.m. Then. By the morning, I, there were already a few answers, and my own my my single contribution was this thumbs up. So like I said, very very well. Thank you very much for supporting each other. And uh, yes, I think I think this worked very well. Yeah. So these were my uh, takeaways. I think uh, these approaches uh, went really well this year. I'm going to keep them all. And I just like to mention that this week I've met my first student from this course. So I was going to the university and someone stopped me on the street saying, hi, thank you very much for the sessions this year. I'm your student. I said, very nice to meet you. I've never seen any of these students because no one uh, uh, showed the camera during the course. But uh, yes, I think feedback uh, has been very good. And uh, I think setting up uh, the collaboration with Vreta was an institutional effort, but I think it will pay off uh, in the long run. We already had more than 1,500 uh, students going through this numeracy training, and uh, I expect to have many more. So thank you very much for having me. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Now let's try to mute so that I can I can actually clap, clap there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank uh, you. Uh, and I noticed there that the most important feedback, uh, the comments on you making jokes, which I always think is 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 quite important. But, but uh, I noticed that in your student feedback comments there at the end. Um, I haven't seen any uh, questions in the Q and A, but interestingly, one of your students is uh, here. 
uh, Ovidu, uh, and there's, uh, they're just reinforcing that, that you're great. Uh, they've only sent that comment to, to us as panellists, but I've, uh, I've taken that opportunity to, to pass that on as well. So there's uh, a bit of real time feedback for you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, there are no uh, questions there, but uh, Ovidu, if it's okay, what we'll do is we'll take a short break now, get colleagues to, to pop things into the chat, and I'm sure that you'll be you know, very happy to, to, to respond to that, uh, along with, with James uh, uh, as well. But I think thank you both for your, your talks at, uh, at this point. Um, so I've done a pretty poor job at uh, keeping on, on time, but I think we've had such fantastic talks, it's been good to, 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 to let them run. I've certainly done a, not as good job as, as, as Kevin, so maybe I'll hand back to him. But can I propose that we maybe sort of take a, a five minute break there, come back at just after 25 uh, to, and we'll have the closing talk uh, by uh, Vesna Perisic uh, from the University of Southampton. So if we come back at 15.36, um, we'll have the closing talk then, if that sounds a, a fair plan. Sounds good to me.
Right, hello everybody. It's time to come back. It's uh, 1536. Okay, so we come to the last talk of the day and uh, you could view this as the last talk of the academic year as well, I, I guess. Oh. <laughs> for, for, for the, uh, oh, so no pressure there. Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> no pressure, no. <laughs> Uh, uh, don't worry. So we'll just kick off because then, and then we can uh, we can finish off to, today with some uh, thoughts on what what we'll be doing next year. Okay. So uh, finish off with uh, Vesna Perasic. Uh, with, uh, with my challenges in teaching analysis during COVID nineteen pandemic and what I did about them. So Vesna. Okay. Okay, so here are my screens. Thank you very much for giving me opportunity to talk about my challenges and what I, I did about them, because basically they occupied me most of the last year, or I don't know, since, since, since the lockdown. So what I'm going to uh, say is basically, so it is to teach analysis in general is a challenge. So I will just give, the kind of skeleton, uh, how it looked like before COVID, what I did uh, looking at that structure through the perspective of the COVID and uh, how the structure is going to be uh, in the post-COVID time that I hope we are entering. So and this is and then, so in brief, teaching and assessment. So in the pre-COVID time, as a module, uh, most of our modules, there were per week, three lectures, one problem class. Assessment was 80% closed book exam, 20% coursework. And coursework was composed of two components, each 10%. One was one in-class test marked by PhD students. And another 10% would be for the homeworks that was individual work that every second week students would submit and would be marked by PhD students. Now, the COVID time, so basically it was unclear. So I did kind of, uh, in a way, mimicking what is previous, what was previously. This I will say a bit later, a bit more of these pre-recorded sessions, but basically there were pre-recorded sessions that we can kind of say. One live online session where people are encouraged to ask the questions. And then they were in-person sessions in small groups. And this was the only module, the only module with that kind of structure. And I will say with that uh, about that as well. And so now uh, this, uh, the rating of the coursework and, uh, ex uh, and, uh, uh, and the exam has changed. 40, 60% and mainly of the colleagues kind of changed like that and was open book exam over, uh, was two plus one, that's three hours in the period of 12 hours. And uh, the components of the coursework, again, my homeworks were 20%, 15% I didn't have in class test per small quizzes, and 5% was reflective journal. And so I will tell you a bit about each of these components and kind of, yeah, so in my, picture. So here is a uh, so teaching material. Basically for this, this is a compulsory module. And at some point we started kind of to develop a booklet or giving the booklets to the students uh, uh, for the compulsory module. And here is analysis booklet that basically I organized with the material that was kind of created by many people that were also teaching analysis before. I teach module, I must say, uh, since 2012. So then I have recorded, I mentioned this two uh, pre-recorded sessions. I did recorded sessions and they are organized in folders like, according to the weeks. And having already this lecture notes, I kind of sometimes would kind of guide students to, uh, it would be like a guided reading. I would say, okay, now stop and look at the lecture notes and then look at this and so on. And my, this kind of 
recording. Okay, I will tell you where was my recording. And then in addition, there are many examples in this booklet and I did using explain everything uh, recorded, quite few examples step by step explaining uh, the procedures and uh, how, how to deal with examples and theory. And uh, I basically, students would email me, could you do this one? And then I would record and put uh, on the blackboard. Okay, so this is where I sit now, and I will not kind of go much into this uh, this uh, structure, but it is in our garden, and it used to be called within a family Swiss cottage. I'm not going to say why Swiss cottage, but now my lecture theater is my lecture shed. So in person teaching, I must say when I have heard about it, this I was scared because kind of we didn't know completely how this teaching is going to uh, look like. And so I have then um, so heard at some point that analysis is going to be module, the only module with uh, in person teaching. And I was really scared. So the purpose was not because it's material that you cannot communicate in different way, but that is said because the students were invited to come to the campus and now to have something that they can kind of come to the campus, kind of keep that connection and have uh, this sense of uh, community belonging and I know. And for some students, this was only in person teaching for entire year. I'm also in UCU and their executive committee and they were very controversial, all this in-person uh, teaching. And I must say they were hard work in the end, but I really enjoyed them. So I, you will see through the through the my slides. And so Whitestone analysis was chosen as the only compulsory module, and probably it was the idea that we are going to be fair with all year two students, all are going to get the same provision. And so now how to organize the whole cohort that is yeah. So I had uh, seven groups of approximately 25 students. It's kind of the numbers work as a multiple of five quite well. And so basically then I was one of the very, very few people from department that was allowed to be on the, in the office, on the campus every day of the week. And I have been kind of teaching all these seven groups, though I could have a help, but then I decided that this is something that I want to do. <laughs> and I was, I was uh, scared also when hearing that the only in-person teaching, and I thought, oh my God, the students are here in Southampton. So only to kind of well, what they cannot do elsewhere is come in person to my in-person classes. And I really kind of was a bit scared, but then I felt also moral obligation to go above and beyond my teaching and supporting the students. So this obligation is coming from background, one thing. And I think I need also to say that I'm from Croatia and we have beginning of the 90s of war. And I kind of in a way saw pandemic in a sense. I, I saw I need kind of to protect the students to kind of go through this phase as least damage as possible. And then my experience, I mentioned already that I'm teaching analysis since 2012. This is my 20th, now I completed my 20th year of teaching in Southampton and currently I'm principal teaching fellow here. Okay, so I'm now going through this uh, individual components and how they transform because this homework was 10% uh, individual work. So now so the, the percentage increased, but what is important is that basically first, so I didn't know how to mark all the work. And I thought if I divide students into the groups, and then I will need to mark less work and be, because the students submit work as a group. So I, after kind of quite a lot of thinking and not knowing exactly what's going to, to happen, in the end, I have organized 36 study groups of five students. So you see here something that is written in a kind of slightly differently. I have also sent the students my slides to kind of feedback. I told them about this workshop today and this is about teaching them. And I did ask them, oh, 
tell me what you think. So they were very surprised about this kind of access, uh, aspect, how we engage. So with our teaching and talking about this and co conferences that was new to them. And so here I added a few comments that uh, students kind of uh, felt should be taught. So I think in some, some other modules, they had the groups, but they were kind of changing. And the students said that keeping groups the same throughout allowed the teams to build connections with each other and find ways that work well for them to complete the work at hand. So basically all the students were reporting that at the beginning, they were a bit scared. How is that going to work? How they are going to work with the people that they don't know that they have never met. But then in the end, so a majority of them kind of got to know people. They become their friends and were talking about my family, my friends and my study groups. So what was quite nice to read. And so what these groups were doing? So as I mentioned, there were five problem sheets. So the tasks were group tasks. So they would need to the given the deadline sub submit solutions for the group. They would, they were, as I said, multiple of five and five people, they would need to negotiate who is the lead, submission lead for each uh, piece of work. And then they would mark work of another group. They would also then upload their feedback. They would need to have the uh, marking lead. And then they, would, they, they were also giving and receiving feedback and commenting on how they have implemented feedback when submitting a new piece of work. And also what students kind of emphasize is this also teaches students how to organize uh, themselves schedule meetings and uh, utilities uh, and utilize the tools available on uh, programs such as uh, Microsoft Teams, what are employability skills now important when the future is filled with remote working. So the people were also kind of commenting on this when applying for internship and asking me to be one of their references. And now 36 groups. I was thinking, oh, I cannot have an overview of 36 groups. So basically I have year three and year four students that were my, so I had projects I called student, student staff partnership or students were my partners, volunteers from year three, year four. So that basically means that previously they have taken this module and they were the first person of contact for each group. So each, uh, then each partner, student partner, were overlooking two or three groups. And so this is just my, so here I want to, I want to keep this and expand for the uh, next year. So now, so the question why the uh, group tutors, so why, why I kind of went to, or how it came up with this student and partners, I think it has, Increasingly, the student staff partnership is kind of gaining on agenda and people already mentioned working with the students, what is really, really very rewarding. But so first I've been told that probably I'm not going to have PhD students to help with everything. So this is then was my, so if you need help, ask for the help. You need to learn to ask for the help, I've been told. And so now why student as a partners? So also a kind of, came out of, I don't know, <laughs> nowhere. So I have this kind of uh, book club. I was invited to become a member of book club that in the end turns into community of practice that was around student as partners agenda. We were reading and commenting to, together Power of Partnership, a book that came in February last year. And there were many discussions. That's how, how idea came quite naturally to me. And I have been then talking with my group, few people from Ireland, from Manchester and, and few universities in UK and we were discussing and they, would, they were my support all the way through. So last summer, end of August, I sent an email around and I was uh, able to recruit 14 students that wanted to act as volunteers. And I must say, I was so scared again, because I thought, oh, I'm not sure exactly what I'm doing. And now I attracted the, our best students to, to volunteer for this. In addition, what I need to 
uh, mentioned two students, according to their marks, they were less kind of, you would say, or the, their marks were less good. And they were questioned their ability. They said, we would really like, love to do this, but we don't know. And so we don't know if our analysis knowledge is good enough. So I did encourage them. I thought it's great that they applied and I'm sure that they have some other experiences that we can use and we will see working together and kind of um, valuing experiences which each one is uh, bringing with them is a kind of underpinning all this kind of partnership agenda. So these are my 14 then amazing uh, students. And so this is, this is basically now I will hear kind of maybe later on when talking about the feedback, I will say a few words about my feedback for, from the student partners. So the, the, you have seen another component where the quizzes, I think originally without COVID, I was thinking, oh, it's time that my analysis is getting some some stuck questions because I do kind of look what people are doing uh, in respect to developing uh, questions to assess uh, analysis. However, I thought if I engaged with this, I'm not ever going to do anything else. So I kind of then uh, so I didn't, didn't continue with that idea. And I, I used uh, so multiple choice questions on Blackboard that I have uh, used uh, for the very first time. And I think I was positive surprise and in with, with the time I also learned to, uh, learn to write quite good questions. However, so there were three tests and so there is also no educational explanation why three. Actually, I didn't manage to write more of these tests. I was teaching also two other modules and I think in total I have written 10 test to three different modules. So I, I was really working to my very limit. And I was also not sure in advance when the test is going to happen, though I would know a week in advance. And students were quite forgiving. So in the past, they always kind of used to know in the through the whole semester what is going to happen when and I just told them okay you will have individual tests as individual work and I will tell you we can in advance and that was good enough for them. So five percent reflective journal. I didn't know anything about reflective journals I must say and I was talking with the people in our education department and this is something what they came up with and they suggested to kind of ask the students to write a reflective journal through the semester about what they were facing as a challenging challenges and what they were doing about them. So now you see the title of my, uh, of my talk because I have repeated so many times to the students, write about challenges and what do you do about them. However, I thought I'm uh, uh, kind of repeating a few times, I had impression I'm suggesting negativity. So I, I also add maybe in all this, you found some strength that you didn't know that you have at the first place. So then I write also about your strengths and how did you use it. And as a result, the students, I think the cohort was 177 students and there were six students who did not submit reflective journals. But all others, I mean, I spent three days nonstop reading these reflective journals and I think I was amazed. I didn't put much of the student feedback because I didn't vote in any way. I think probably the only fair way would be to take a random comment because I didn't want to evaluate students' comments. That, that, that kind of brought so insight from so into the student's life in this challenging time. So now we would like kind of to evaluate the scared exams coming, what's going to happen. So you have on one side of this slide, 
how the exam was, the, the, the results, the average. I mean, that is very simplified way of looking into it. But just looking at this very basic uh, uh, level that is easy to compare. The weighting, as I already mentioned, was 20%, 80%. So the total mark is uh, in, in the middle. So you have seen 1920 was average 54 for the module. Before that was a 60 and 57. And so maybe this slightly lower 54 is that that was the year when I, when UCU kind of uh, always, there was strike, I was on a strike. So they probably influenced the students learn. So now the, um, the rating in this COVID time is a 40 for coursework and 60 for open book exam. And so the average mark is 69. I think that students are much, much happier. So it is 91% coursework and 55% exam. I kind of, it was open book exam and I kind of put quite a lot of effort to make exam the relevant for our module based on our teaching material, but then not easy to Google. And, or I, I, I thought maybe it's not easy to Google and probably with this 55% uh, average uh, students were not able easily to Google or didn't. So basically our, Google, our booklet became kind of focus learning material and 90% because the majority of the students engage with all activities and that was the average of the coursework. Now, so two things have, has, have happened that I have changed the nature of the coursework as well as the weighting. And uh, with the weighting in the past of 20%, then average here would be 62%, what kind of wouldn't be much uh, different from the previous. And so now, I mean, I'm asking uh, usually many questions with uh, respect to kind of procedures because I am exams officer and director of assessment. And there are many questions then raised in that kind of environment. And my vector asks, is it fair to uh, give easy marks because the coursework marks were in a way considered to be easy marks? And so I, I thought about the fairness in advance. And I thought since it's compulsory module that everyone is taking, it is fair for this generations. But then the question was, what is with the past generations or the, with the futures? And that, then I thought there are so many different aspects that this generation could say, it's not fair comparing with the previous or coming one. So I kind of didn't do that uh, kind of comparison. And the student feedback, I will be very short. I'm not sure how much time, or oh, I think I was kind of too, too much talking. So the students would email me after they met with their groups and they, they were sharing so many things. And so I kind of really love when students say, oh, I made a very, very time speech in English before preparing a script. It was so exciting telling about it, how he managed to communicate math and how everyone in the group encouraged him and he didn't prepare his script in advance. And the students were really mainly positive. So students usually, so as I said, I read many of these reflective journals and the students usually were skeptic a bit about their kind of working with the people that they don't know in the uh, study group, but that in the majority of the cases, I think I remember one person that didn't like it to the end. And then I met that person and we discussed why he didn't like it. So, and that is then the students. So here are the feedback for my partners. I would meet them every second week yeah, because that would be a, a end of one cycle and we would discuss what, what kind of was going well, what didn't go well, what we can improve on and so on. And there were, what was interesting is, so having a meeting, uh, MS team meeting with them, very first meeting was with, with their cameras off, but then in the next one was a camera on. And if somebody would keep camera off, then would explain what was the problem. So students got mentioning award in the Dean's delight, delight at the Christmas party as 
where Dean emphasized that when they, they went an extra mile in supporting fellow students during COVID. And what does this mean for my analysis? I don't know if you <laughs> recognize the first quote, COVID-19 crisis did not go to waste. I read somewhere that the Churchill said a good crisis, you, don't need, you, you shouldn't uh, let go to waste. So I think this COVID crisis, it is crisis. And I think with respect to analysis, it didn't go to waste. <laughs> I, my, I think my teaching was a hard work, but I feel much more rewarded that, than usually. And so I think for me, it was more authentic because it was kind of more of this social learning and getting to know students in spite of the fact that the majority of them never have seen in life and that sometimes people stop me on the campus or somewhere saying, oh, are you Vesna? Did you, you teach me analysis? I was your student. And then, so yeah. And so I do think that this kind of, I'm going to then do the student partners. I already have seven volunteers who said, oh, we would like to do it next year as a, a module leads. And I would kind of keep this random group. So now my, yeah, so our organizations, I will see how, because some of organizations came because of the COVID structure imposed. Maybe some will reshape, but the core will kind of remain. And thank you, sorry, I think <laughs> this was a bit long story, but so yeah, this is my analysis story, what I did and what I'm going to uh, keep and what I learned. And thank you for being able to share the story. And I think I'm now stop sharing it. Okay, yes, thank you. <laughs> cool. um, well, well, uh, maybe we'll just because we're, we're slightly over time here. Yeah, yeah, I'm so so sorry. You could have stopped me anytime. I know because it's a whole story, and I try to keep all aspects, but brief. Yeah. So, sh should we? Should we just um, uh, maybe maybe ask just one question then? Because uh, there's an interesting one which I think a lot of people would like to know the answer to on this one. How do you deal with a student who wants to keep his stroke her life private? You know, so yeah. what what do you mean in the in the, the, with respect to the study groups or? Yeah, I think that's what it, uh, what it means because it, the, the, you you were asking him to do reflective journals and interact with other students. Oh yeah, so so the, the the marking was yeah, so the marking was through the blackboard and it was anonymous. So for the many of the things, I don't know who said it because I was kind of reading these documents over three day intense. My head was full of the comments, but if I would like to have exact quote from the students, I think I would need to do the more research. And that is, I mean, that came from School of Education. We said the students did ask how to reflect. Some students, so this is kind of, I think, important to use the skills that students uh, already have, because some students didn't know anything about uh, reflections. But uh, the students coming from Wales, having a Wales baccalaurea or something like that, they said that they would so frequently need to reflect. And he was very comfortable with this. And he worked with a small group of my partners, student partners who also had experience with the reflecting for another module. And they put then some instructions together and we created on a blackboard a folder how to, and one was how to write a reflective journal. And since I kind of couldn't control, are we talking nonsense? And when we kind of completed document, I sent to colleagues to the School of Education saying, is this approximately okay to give us to students as instructions? And so that is. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, uh, just like to uh, thank thank you once more for such a great talk, and of course, thanks to uh, all other uh, presenters today. Um, and perhaps if you'd if you'd like to answer the questions in the, you, you you can answer the questions via typing answers. So if you'd like to do that, at some oh, okay, point. yeah. So I will then. I couldn't. Yes. So I will questions and answers. So I can. We'll, we'll I show can you how answer. to do that later. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay, because um, I kind of couldn't talk and look at. This. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll hand over to Michael to uh, to have some uh, some final words, as it were. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Kevin. I, I think looking out of the window and seeing the sun shining, uh, I, I think I will aim to keep these quite brief so that we can uh, 
all take advantage of, uh, of some, some sh sunshine. Hopefully it is, the sun is also shining wherever you are. Um, but I think, again, another great series of talks. And, and I think what's really lovely to see are how people have kind of learned from the experiences. There's been lots of reflection, some links into learning from other colleagues who've been part of, uh, uh, of, of, of Talmo. Uh, and I kind of sort of see there's a number of colleagues who were, uh, you know, Tom Wicks, uh, uh, Sue from, um, you know, lots of colleagues have spoken, Colin Steele have spoken at Talmo events uh, and have kind of joined us on this, this talk as well. So I think some, some, some great um, learning from the experiences of others. But I think one thing that, that leapt out to me is a group that we haven't really perhaps mentioned or said thank you to, which are the PhD students. And I think PhD students have cropped up quite a lot in the, in the kind of the, the comments that we've had today about their work in supporting the teaching that's gone on. Uh, and I certainly know from, from you know, my own experience at Birmingham that our, our PhDs, our PGTA students who helped us out with teaching have done a fantastic job. Uh, and they've also had to adapt to some of the challenges with our online support and, uh, and online marking as well. So I think they, they deserve a big thanks. Um, so really just to say thank you to all of our speakers uh, once again, not just uh, for today, but indeed everyone did a fantastic job today with some great talks, but also throughout the, the last year of Talmo. Um, that isn't saying that's the end of Talmo. The, the, I think I'll, I'll, on behalf of, of Kevin and Rachel, um, who really have been key to, to, to driving this forward over the last year, to say that our plans for Talmo are that we intend to continue it into the next academic year. I think that possibly will be the the end of the online events for this academic year. I think Kevin hinted at that. I think we're all headed into a summer where we do want a, a bit of a breather. Um, but I think the, the plan is, and again, we welcome your feedback on this and your ideas and your suggestions, is we'll turn it into a, a, an online seminar series for teaching mathematics in, in higher education. So whilst it may well focus upon kind of aspects of online delivery, I think there's a good opportunity here to broaden it out to some of the challenges, some of the things that we're doing, perhaps in more face-to-face -face delivery, the hybrid model that, that you know, Mark really introduced earlier when he was talking about, uh, about flipping. So the plan will be, certainly we will value that, the opportunity to get colleagues together to deliver talks on aspects of maths education. We'll try and facilitate those over Talmo. Um, we'll decide the, the kind of the numbers that, that, that we run. It won't be weekly. Um, you know, we might have two to three per semester. We'll see how it goes. We'll see what the demand is, but we'll try and get a regular slot uh, and really just kind of make this available to everyone because I think the way in which our communities come together really is, is, is great testament to, the, to, to the, the fantastic people in the mass community, the way that we share ideas. So let's use Talmo to... Um, facilitate some of our, our regular teaching. So uh, I see three positive comments, um, four positive comments as well. Um, Tom, Tom adds another comment in there as well. Um, I think there'll be demand. Uh, again, if you've got ideas, suggestions, you're interested in possibly doing these, again, we'll pick these up in, in the start of the next academic year. I think we'll take a breather. Drop us an email, either myself, Kevin, uh, or, or, or Rachel, uh, and we'll, we'll be in touch. So that I think is it from me. I think a big thank you to everyone uh, who spoke, everyone who's attended, and in particular again to uh, Kevin and, and, and Rachel, because this really did start off as a random conversation that, that we had uh, last year about how we support people online. Um, and, and both of them have really been key in, in, in driving this forward. So um, we're delighted to be able to continue it in some way. Kevin, I don't know whether you want to have the final words or say anything. Well, I, I don't know if I should have the final words because, uh, you know, I, I was thinking of saying something and then handing over to Rachel because we haven't heard from Rachel today because she's been uh, um, working on data rather than uh, a proper internet. So, she, so um, but anyway, I, w yeah, I, I would just say it has been quite a year, um, been, been a terrible year in many respects, but it's been absolutely fantastic to have been part of Talmo and I'd like to thank anybody who contributed in any way, even if it was just saying hello in the chat and making us all feel better. Um, but we've seen some great talks that have been really, really helpful. Um, thanks for just turning up and uh, attending and, uh, you know, as I say, dropping things in the chat uh, to help people. I think that's been one of the most, 
think that's one of you been one of the best things I've seen this this year is 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 how so many people just helped out and just said okay yeah yeah I'll I'll do this and uh, you know helped us all in what as I say is quite a bad year <laughs> quite a terrible year but I, I think it's been a high point for me d doing this um, so thanks to everybody thanks to Michael and Rachel in particular and saying that uh, is can, Rachel are you able to I, I'm going to speak on behalf of, of Rachel I think. Uh... Rachel's going to echo the comments in the chat, I believe. So Rachel's just posted in the chat due to internet problems. All right. Do we want to read that out? Do we want to just let people there? Uh... Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll read it out. But uh, it just says, uh, echoing my thanks to everyone who's contributed. It's been fun and great to have seen how supportive the community has been uh, this last year. I think those are very wise words to to end this seminar on and apparent yep oh there's more it's been the most fun thing i've done this year by a long way i think many of us can can share that that sentiment it really has been great fun to do these uh, events and, and in, interacting albeit an online way with so many people but i really do uh, look forward to getting together with everyone in a room and being able to have that interaction over coffee and lunch and a drink or whatever it might be um, because i think that's much needed for us all so that's it from me. And that's it from me as well. And I presume that's it from, from Rachel. We'll see you again in the uh, after the summer. Have a good break. <laughs>